So just really quick before I start, I have technically started the Kubera already a very, very long time ago. I didn't remember much, but I used to read it, but I dropped it in about 2015. And it's not really that I dropped it. I did the thing where I said, you know what? The weekly slog is kind of getting to me. I'm going to let a couple of chapters stack up and then I'm going to keep reading it. And I just never, never got back to it. So I was somewhere in season two. Not that far, but somewhere in season two around the time that I stopped reading it, about 2015, 2016-ish. So I want to make that clear. This is going to be a discussion solely about season one. Then I'm going to have a follow-up stream so we can speak about some other things, things you guys thought I, I got wrong, things you disagreed with, whatever the case is. I'll probably be reading out some comments too on that stream. Uh, it's going to be on Twitch, then I'm going to premiere it on YouTube, and I think that's about it. Like, subscribe if you're new here, and hit the bell of dawn so the ghost of the 13 month series doesn't get you, and let's hop right in. A little something like Eenie, Meenie, rap in the beginning, smoke a little pack, but a pack never timid, church, but I'm seeing it, curse when I'm winning, she need a new back when it's back, I'm gonna bend it, slap up some guinea, ask me to hint it, watch a nigga black, so react, I'm gonna quit it, swerve in the Benzie, perfume is Fendi, bob and move fast, real fast like I'm Ricky, this is from pretty, came from the dirt, showing up a nigga can't handle the work, y'all, swing with it first, young white girl like a rapper. One final thing. I am not going to be heavily editing this video, so you can kind of just listen, just listen. You don't have to be like laser focused on the screen looking at all the stuff. I'm not going to be going crazy. I'm just going to be speaking, rambling. You know how it is with me. But yeah, um, this is not, this, uh, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I don't script anything. I just click record and I start speaking, so let's just do this. I would like to ease everyone's uh, nerves a little bit by saying right off the bat, I like Kubera. Kubera is really good. I don't, I don't think it's bad at all. I never thought it was bad. Even when I stopped reading it, I just, it, it just happens with me a lot. Of I have not read Lookism in years, and God of High School I haven't read since like 2015. It just happens. I don't have to tell you. It has nothing to do with the story itself. Sometimes I just fall off because I'm washed up. But it's really good. I understand why a lot of people have the level of praise. For this series that they do because i'm always seeing curry gum globe especially with some of the later content in the later series but i don't think it's perfect especially not season one i think i have a lot of the same issues with the first time i read it that i do right now but i just because i have criticism does not mean i think it's bad so please don't freak out in the comments if you disagree with what i'm saying that's totally fine just be respectful about it because i will choose violence some of y'all be get be getting mad disrespectful in the comment section and you would not speak to me like this in real life because i would fucking smack the shit out you so watch your damn mouth all right so solid writing from the get-go I think that this is a series that has a very good grasp of what it is it wants to be and what it what it wants to build upon. Like, sometimes I can kind of read something and I can tell the writer is just kind of doing it on the fly. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of great stories that were written on a week-to-week, -week, issue to issue, chapter to chapter basis. But this is one of those narratives where I feel like, oh, from like the first couple of lines, I'm like, oh, this this content creator this creative team this writer this artist whatever curry gum she knows exactly what she want, wants to do here and i and i can um i can appreciate that i can't speak on the technical level of their writing so to speak because obviously this is being translated from korean but for the most part i could i think the writing itself is solid though i did have a couple of like like Ash and Asha, and then some. I think sometimes they got the pronouns wrong for a couple of characters where it should be a he, there was a she, and maybe if this was a she, there was a he. I could be mistaken, be mistaken on that front, but I think Line is just terrible at translations in general, so it wouldn't shock me if they just kind of got it wrong. But yeah, Curry Gum like the setup goddess. I could really appreciate that. It's incredibly well thought out, like I said, with attention to detail, to the point where it's like, there's a lot of things that I think that I noticed, I could be wrong, uh, where I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Like, I remember when I'm seeing some of the, like, candidates for some of the tests, and it's like, you know, N11122550, it's like, okay, the year, N11, 12th month, 25th day, contestant number 50, and that's how they got the number. Things like uh, a week is 12 days, a month is, uh, sorry. A week is 12 days a month is a year and there are just a lot of instances where i felt like oh wow like this level of like just kind of i'm 
I'm gonna craft this thing and I'm not gonna cut any corners was pretty 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 impressive because I even remember with Asha I'm sorry if I'm not remembering this one correctly but with Asha's birthday attributes to Sky Indra plus Wind Vayu and Destruction Marut or Maru um that was like the way that she was able to apply that to actually using the open the, the open space or the barrier to protect the the city of Atara from the outside attacks. I was like, this is all very very interesting, and I know and I can see how it's all kind of adding up in small little ways. Like, my guess is that a lot of this payoff for the setup that's happening now is going to really show its face and come full circle in season two and later on in the third season but i can already see some of it coming full circle i feel like every series has a moment where like it hooks somebody i think it has an intended hook but like what i mean where it's like you could be reading something and like i'm enjoying this narrative but then this specific event happens or this specific character is introduced and then you strap in like I'm not getting off this ride. For me, this was when the kind of quote unquote nameless god who I'm assuming is Kubera, the actual Kubera, not Lee's or Les. I think it's Lee's though, I'm going to go with Lee's, um, says you're wasting the power of name. And it's just something with the way that he came and said it using his chibi form and now he grown as fuck, mad strong and everything. I'm like that's just a bar because from the time we've been hearing like don't use your real name outside the outside the town and you know you go by Kubera or Lee's Hayes or Hayes whatever it was and it's like you're starting to see like this her name being Kubera means something significant and then as we got some more later explanations about the god and the primeval gods and how the power of name and soul and things of that nature kind of tie into the power of a god I was like yeah, I don't think I've gotten the full payoff yet, but there's little tiny things and little snippets and, you know, smack rooms that I'm getting that I'm, like, interesting. Even when Agni was like, I already used a little bit of insight. Tell me why you are searching for the power of the name. It's it's dope. It's really good. Uh, I think this was around the time we were talking about, I think, I think the how gods were structured how their bodies were completely different from humans and suras they can't be separated from their souls and they got the power of memory name and like just power in general and they all kind of form a concept so like i said incredible attention to detail credible incredibly informative even even with things that are just like this is probably not something that's vital in terms of you explaining it like this, but it's just nice to know. And for anyone who's a super duper lore nerd or world building guy, girl or gal, this is great for it. I'm not a person who care, really cares about lore and world building like that. I care. The thing that I care about a narrative uh, the most at this point in my life is characters and the actual narrative itself. So the, the central plot and the subplot. So things like that and character arc so those are things that i care about the most and i'm not particularly big into world building but i can see that this is really been done really well done with like the human realm the servo realm the gods how the world was created how um gods tie into humans and servos and things like that like x y and z like i'm seeing it i'm like like i, I know i'm not there yet and i'm not i haven't gotten the full payoff i can tell but i can I could feel it. You know, it's coming. Like, I could feel it. I could feel it in my bones. It's really good stuff. Kubera is hilarious. The character herself is funny, but, like, this 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 Manhua webtoon is fucking funny. I did not remember it being this funny. Like, I kid you not, there are so many instances where I am legitimately just cracking the hell up. When we finally cut back to, I think, the kind of channel way to when we, when we were transitioning from um, uh, the night at Rain Fire into the power of the name. And just like, meanwhile, Lee says, I think that guy is scared. He must be really weak. What a weak guy. And like, they're just roasting Rand for no reason. Like, bro, chill on him. I remember when Agony and, um, sorry if I, if I mispronounced this guy's name, it's like, um, Gandaravara. I'm sorry, I know I know I butchered it, but you know what I'm talking about. Um he's looking for his daughter. It's like Gand like Gandavara, right? When they, when Agni and him first meet, and like you know what it feels like? If I thought myself out, well you wouldn't know because you don't freeze, I'm gonna burn your hair so like you go bald. He started burning his hair and like that guy did not care at all. Like I'm like, oh my goodness. 
and the detailed plan that they had to like get him to burn up his power to kind of kill the summoner with Bril uh, Brilith. I was like, oh my goodness, like they're they're playing like some 5D chess here. That's 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 really interesting, and I, and I like it. One of my favorite jokes. I, I'll probably never forget this. It was so hilarious when Kubera actually gets the bracelet on, and she's like, "Tell me how to get this off." You must know how it works. <laughs> and immediately, because there's four different ways. While that many, cut off your head. <laughs> Two, die. <laughs> Three, get help from one of the fifth mind gods. <laughs> the highest spiritual rank of a god. Whatever, whatever. And then, like, I don't even think they got to the fourth one. I don't remember, but it was just funny because she's like, yo, do you have any reasonable way of getting this bracelet off my fucking wrist? Like, yo, this shit is so funny like it's actually hilarious i i was having a good time i i can't even lie to you asha having like no naming sense um remember when she when they wanted to name yuta when yuta joined the party and after uh <laughs> um asha was like all right since he has black hair blacky he have white skin white as a compromised body and she's like Cooper's like what the fuck is this shit <laughs> crumbles onto paper <laughs> throws it <laughs> And after she starts roasting her for like her creativity of having no naming sense, and after you know, actually joke, but I'm gonna take your ear off or all that stuff. It's just there's a lot of very very good little jokes in there that I really appreciate. So it's really funny. And one thing about me is if I'm having a good time and I'm laughing, I will stick around. And even like agony, you know, idiot Smithy, idiot whatever, like he's uh he makes me laugh too. And so yeah, good stuff, good stuff. The magic system so far seems very solid. It seems to be really well thought out. I haven't obviously properly dived into it. Like I have, I've met only a handful of fighters and very, very competent high level musicians. I am learning about the need to calculate and not calculate how like Kubera can kind of just, I think it was called a Klein bottle, but like kind of just imagine like incredible shapes that you couldn't really, I don't know, wrap your mind around and just do things without necessarily calculating. Because Ran does the same thing too, although he does freeze his hand a lot. And then Asha, as the goat magician, <laughs> uh, she just decalculates it normally and whatnot. So there, I don't want to comment on it too hard, too hardly in any direction right now because I do think I'm still very new to it. But I like it. I think the magic system has been good. Uh, you know, oh, damn, it, I don't remember none of the spells. Hot, hot knee. Agni, Kubera, Hotni, I don't know, but, it, but, there, but it's, it's good stuff, and it ties back to the gods and the gods' names and everything, so, I don't know, man, it's just, I could, I could really understand why somebody would be super impressed with this, because I haven't really read too many webtoons with, I, I would say, that care about the minutia like this, like, very, very minute details that are probably not important to the common person, but for somebody who really cares, they're gonna appreciate this, reminds me of, like, video games that'll do something very small in terms of an easter egg or like you know if a character goes into a water that's cold they might shiver a little bit and you know like you don't have to do that maybe you just have their health bar go down a little bit to show like yeah you're in the cold water too long but like that like you get out the water and they're shivering and you're seeing the the water drip off the the character model while you're seeing the like wet footprints eventually dry out and the characters dry now like Small things like that go a long way for a lot of people. So, Curry Gump, shout out to you for all this. Now, let's talk about some things that I'm not particularly a fan of, of, of thus far. It's slow. It's very slow, and I promise you, I am a patient man. I am patient as all hell. I am not complaining about the pacing. I don't think it's bad pacing. It's just Curry Gump never seems to be in a rush to get to any particular major reveal plot point confrontation battle whatever the case whatever the case is like it just doesn't seem like she's ever in a rush it's like i'm gonna take my time i'm gonna pick my spots on some Kawhi leonard shit just take high efficiency mid-range and three point shots type b and it's just like i can respect that but a lot of the times just like for me when i'm just kind of going through the read the, the, the slog of reading it it's like come on like I, I i would wish that we could kind of pick the pacing up like this thing took 10 chapters to get to, I think we could have done it in six. That's just a personal thing. 
maybe that's something that gets corrected more so in the second season and maybe in third season, but it's definitely taking its time. But here's the thing that I appreciate about slow starts and why I actually am a fan of narratives that take its time. First of all, I think we've come into a time and an era and a period where we're constantly in a rush to get to the major things, the high of the highest of highs in a narrative. And I think a lot of that has to do with human beings' attention spans probably lessening to some degree. There's probably a study on this. I don't know. I'm not good. I'm not a nerd like that. But with like Vine, six seconds or less and things like that, it's like I think pe people's attention span is, is very bad to the point where I could flip a game on and start a narrative and I feel like it's doing too much to grab my attention. It's like, you know, the very first panel... Did someone jumps out the cliff and they're shooting the guns backwards a building blows up and it's like I can't believe I just stole the power from a demigod and it's, they're like barreling into like it's like okay calm down like, I understand the action scene is meant to hook the reader in but it's like when you take the time to really build that foundation on which everything else will be built upon which is why I'm probably going to name this video something like Kubera season one incredible foundation incredible building blocks something of the sort just because i think that's what it is what you allow is that when this when the writer artist creative team is really ready to hit that stride of here is reveal after reveal here's action piece after action piece here's you know this character finally meaning this character you don't have, they, they don't have to hold back they can just go all in on the action all in on the you know info dump lore dump whatever the case because it's just like yes i spent so much time building it up here's the payoff just run with it have fun and i imagine with kubera that's gonna come at some point so i'm not really complaining that it's slow I'm complaining that i hate that it's that kurgan never in a rush it's just something that i noticed and i do wish sometimes we could pick it up a little bit because i do think there's a little bit of efficiency being lost here where i'm like no you can you could have got to this in six chapters even though you took 10 slash 11 so yeah i definitely think this series would benefit from more action and more fights and more you know action sequences in general i do think the presentation right now is a little bit lacking it's early season one even tower of god in a lot of ways i would say yeah tower of god took its time for it to hit its artistic stride so i think curry gum is gonna hit that and i've seen some of the later artwork it looks beautiful I saw some of the improvement already, so this is not me saying, shit art, you're a bad artist, the artistry is terrible. First of all, beauty is an eye of the beholder, so, you know, it's Easter own. I, I just think like the actual presentation itself in terms of um, the paneling and the, yeah, the artistry a little bit, but the way that it's shown, I think that, I think it leaves a lot to be desired as, as of right now. I think maybe... Kuri Gom's strength lies in her writing, not necessarily the artistry, so... That's what it looks like to me, and that might change, but I the thing about me is like if I'm reading a comic book, right? A web to a graphic novel, if you will, and I'm not particularly mesmerized, mesmerized by the artistry itself, but I like the writing, it bothers me because I have a very active imagination. You turn this into a novel, a light novel, a visual novel, something I'm just reading, and I can actually imagine the characters in the world and things like that itself, I'll have a much better time. So I'm hoping that maybe this gets rectified to some degree. And think about like Harry, like, like Harry Potter or like Twilight or I don't know whatever you like to read, Maze Runner. I don't know what I don't know what people read anymore, right? <laughs> Storm, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me, Brandon uh, Sanderson stuff, right? Like I imagine when these things are being made into a movie, for a lot of for a lot of us, the movie never holds up to what we created in our heads, like because our imaginations are so vivid and I have a very vivid imagination, uh, personally speaking. But anyways, I, I, I just think it would benefit from more action, more fights. I don't know if this ever becomes a more action focused series, or at least there's more, uh, combat in it, but I definitely think with beings, this powerful, godly beings and powers like this and the magics with magicians and fighters, fighter magician hybrids, this needs to kind of step its step up its game in the later seasons with some of its combat and whatnot and i'm gonna leave it at that the cast of kubera thus far has been fantastic i have been enjoying them thoroughly uh, for the most part i do want to say this real quick before i forget it before i forget and i don't know where i would place this kubera's friend that gave her the gift that got punched and survived it 
is is this story trying to insinuate that he is very good at avoiding death whether it's like luck is on his side to the degree that he won't die yet or at least until a certain moment because it felt like he escaped death a lot of times of going to buy kubera's gift and then when the, i can't remember her name right now i'm so sorry is it no i don't remember her name but the pigtails she's a leader right now she came with the blue hair to um to find the person with the power of the, the name of the god when the when the surs were attacking uh brillis town like uh, i think ateria is what it's called atura around that time he like said she was pretty and you know he, and she was gonna kill all the humans there said, you know what he said something really good i'm gonna let him rock you know it's like there was a, there was a couple of instances like that where it's like is this story trying to be t trying to tell me that hey this is a character that kind of evades death because that's that's really cool i like that like um I don't know how significant that is or it's going to be, but I can appreciate that it's already being built in like early. So if I see instances later on where it happens, I'm not going to think it's nonsense. And I want to co comment on a couple other things that I think that I noticed real quick before I kind of talk about the characters. I, it feels like Lee's is connection to a lot of these characters like Ran and Asha is a little more detailed than I thought. I thought maybe Lee's just, I mean, Asha just wanted her because of the Kubera thing, but it's like Asha was a survivor of Cart in N4 or N5 that year. Reve I, I wanted revenge. And then we kind of just recently learned that uh, Kubera's father, Rao Lee's, died around that time. I don't know if that's related. And then, um, ah, oh, damn, I can't remember the rest. But yeah, like, it just certain certain things like that. Like, it's like very interesting. So I'm trying to I'm trying to put these things together. And with Lee's constantly blacking out when they're using, when she's using powers, it's like hiding hiding how she needs to know how incredible she truly is. So I hope that that that, that stops being a gimmick sooner rather than later. There was something about the Chaos Clan that I was trying to rack my brain to remember about the magic that they could cancel out. The Chaos Suras. I think it had to do with Hotney Bra uh, Brahma and Hotney Vishnu. Where it was like Vishnu was a, pr a primeval god so I think the chaos gods can't nullify magic from those specific gods. And since Brahma is also one, maybe that's why the raft that Ran and company was on in like the little channels with the fit to all the numbers didn't go away. But other magic uh, did not work when their eyes were on them. If I'm if I'm totally off, just tell me. I'm sorry. I don't want to. I'm not really a theory person like that. I kind of just like to analyze what I do and don't know. But I felt like I was noticing stuff like that, but okay. Let me talk about the cast a little bit. Kubera is a good lead. I actually think Kubera is an excellent lead so far. It's just very frustrating as of right now because Kubera is pretty useless. We are getting all of the, you know, the hype for, hey, you're you're a lot more special than you're giving yourself credit for, power of the name. You know, uh, you're a decent magician that can uh, do stuff without calculation, very physically gifted. But it's like, she's so dead, so much dead weight right now. They're always batting her up, calling her ugly. Stop calling her ugly. I, I think I heard said that Tina Curry gum actually draws her pretty she really is. Nah, she beautiful. All right? Okay. <laughs> she's beautiful. She's hilarious. But I do hope we're going to get to a moment. I think I already, I think it's going to happen because I did see some, I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of my friends read this, so I do see panels. It does seem like Kubera obviously breaks out of that sheltered, babied, someone has to take care of you, your dead weight roll down the line. So I'm guessing there's kind of a point where maybe she'll use a power and not black out. Because it looked to me like she used fusion fusion magic that like uh, Ari did, which we'll talk about later on, where um, with the Yuta part, like the, the lies or who lied to you, like, like the last arc of like the, the first season. She was using um, Hadi Kubera and then healed herself the same way that uh, ID was doing that against one of the Suras. So I noticed that. I see. I see. I see. I see I, I'm paying attention. Respect me, because I'm. Trust me, I'm not good at this stuff on the first read. On the first week read, because people are often impressed by how much stuff that I know in Tower of God and things like One Piece and Avatar or Kingdom Hearts, but it's not, it's, it's not like, it's not that impressive. I'm not a genius. I don't just play this thing once and remember everything. 
I have played Kingdom Hearts so many times that a lot of this stuff is just stuck in my head. I revisit One Piece and Tower of God for a lot of videos, just, in, just when I'm bored, just because I like it a lot. That a lot of these things are just stuck in my head. I, it's, it's over repetition that I remember these things. It's not I read it once and I'm some type of storage genius and I can just remember all these things that I have in the archives in my brain. I don't work like that. I'm not, I'm not that smart at all. <laughs> not even a little bit. But yes, excellent lead. Hope that she breaks out of that uh, that that role though. So, but I, but I could already kind of see it coming. So I, I I doubt it's gonna be a problem. Believe it or not, I don't like Yuta yet, but I know I'm going to like Yuta coming 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 uh in the future because Yuta has been built up to be so important and vital moving forward that I can tell, and Yuta became interesting when the fake mom type beat was like, hey. You know, I've seen a bit of the future and the future of you attacking Kubera. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Because I kind of ship them, not gonna hold you. And especially since Kubera has that, like, you know, discrimination against, like, the half. I, I want to say half Sura, I can't, if, I, if I remember correctly right now. I'm sorry if I'm off. Maybe it was a quarter. I, by, the, by the way, the whole Sura stuff with, like, quarters and halves and fulls and how they age and stuff, all that's been really good. Uh, really good stuff and discrimination against them and some how some of them are being sold and stuff. It's it's all it's all all those building block stuff is just in there in the, in the narrative, just sprinkled in like chef's kiss. Uh yeah, Ran is funny. I like him. His misunderstanding is so hilarious to me about like thinking Asha and Kubera are dating and doesn't know Asha is a girl. Respect respect her, man. Stop it. But yeah, Utah's gonna be dope. Uh, I like Ran a lot. There's a lot of characters that I like that I probably can't remember off the top of my head, just just, just like that. But I do want to talk about some of my personal favorite characters, uh, if you don't mind. Believe it or not, this might shock you. My favorite character is Irie. With the with the purple hair and the pigtail at this point. She's always with the girl with the glasses. I that was had to, had to remake the staff, the Agni staff, and like turned into like, this weird abomination. And there was arguing and stuff. She is so funny. And I just enjoyed her because she made me laugh from that standpoint. But I honestly was so fucking impressed during the night it rained fire where she just took action. It was like, all right, I'm going to take, take up, I'm going to fight this Sora. Sora. She was a fighter that's good with, 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 um, or maybe she's a magician that's good with, um, it's a good fighter, but she's like a hybrid. Saw her using some hybrid magic, healing herself, taking that Sora away. By kind of getting like kind of making him intrigued by her and like fighting back like the fact that she was putting up such a good fight against a being of this caliber was impressive to me and it was like without hesitation it was like she's a woman of action and i fucking love that i can appreciate that like just just stole my heart right in that moment and she's fucking sexy by the way curry gum stop stop all these pretty boys all these pretty k-pop boys <laughs> swooping in open shirt stop stop they too they too sexy the too too much sexiness <laughs> i need you to stop you know like when um like the like the actual kubera picks up lees and like holding her and like cut, stop when agni holds brilith stop my my heart too much too much sexy boys but um ash up my second favorite character why is she so fucking disrespectful so rude, so dry. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's just, I I can't I I stand. That is one of the greatest magici magicians. You gonna put respect on her, okay? That is top. She's top three right now. Brillith, the priest. Listen, devotion to that to, to your nation, to the people. Even though when she wanna break a death, you're like yo fuck these people. I I I, I feel it. Fuck fuck them niggas, man. <laughs> fuck them. But uh. Her relationship with Agni uh, and their dichotomy is just so incredible. Seeing how much she cares for the people, how much she shoulders for them, and how much she misunderstood for, for, in a lot of ways how, mu how much respect and love Agni has for her. By the way, this is the best fucking ship. You better fucking ship it or I'll find you and I'll find you when I find you. I'm going to throw you into the sun. But yeah, I ship it. <laughs> I, need, I need it to happen. Like a god falling in love with a human. It's just I don't know. It's it's beautiful to some to some degree. So yeah, I I like Bella a lot too. She and she's and she's fucking bad, obviously. Maruna, shout out to the Garuda clan. I like him, man. He cool. He just cool. Like he, 
You know when someone just has like a really uh, amazing, you know, coolness factor? His hand in his pocket, he be posing the way that they kind of like he talks. At first, I thought he was the only person that spoke like this, but it's like a, maybe a higher level Nakitska, whatever sort of thing. I'm gonna have a hard time remembering a lot of these terms. I'm gonna have to. I'm counting on you guys to keep me reined in if I'm misremembering terms and um misremembering from information because. I have not read a lot of the blog stuff yet. I'm counting on you guys to supplement me with that information, by the way. But we'll talk about it in the stream that comes after this video. I like Maruna. I, I, and I really want to see how he grows moving forward. The relationship that he has with, with Utah and his other siblings, so to speak. That's going to be really cool. And then if you, had to, if you had to force me to pick a fifth favorite right now, it's either between Rad and Agni. I'm going to give it to Agni with the way that he came through with the pretty boy swagging at the very end to save Brillith and stuff. And after said, hey, listen, when you're happy and your vigor replenishes better, yada, yada, like it just, I don't know. And the new outfit she got and he was like, no, it's not revealing. And I just, I don't know. I, just, I don't know. He, he's, he's awesome. I like him a lot. He's, he's really good. But those are like my favorite characters. Uh, I think Kubera might end up going up in the ranks at some point, but I think I, for the most part, have said everything I needed to say. Uh, a lot of great characters, a lot of great moments, great panels, though I do think the artwork could, and presentation of the manhua itself can, uh, can use a little bit of work, but uh, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be good moving forward. I didn't speak too much about uh, Gand, uh, Ganvara, Ganhavara, sorry, but uh, he's really cool, uh, and I and I and I sympathize with his struggle and plight to find his daughter and stuff. So we'll see how that turns out, how it plays out, and yeah, I think that's good for the time being. But let me know what you guys think about Kubera. What's that about the video? Definitely stay tuned for the stream that I'm gonna have after this, and then I'm gonna do I'm gonna be doing this season by season. If you guys are interested in seeing me read kubera like live i don't mind doing it on twitch a couple of times i don't want to read the entire thing so it'll be i'll just pick random days and i'll just tell you where i am and what i read last and then read that day if that's cool with you guys let me know um i did forget one thing i want to talk about so when the blue why can i remember her name i like her a lot too the blue hair girl who's leading the clan right now when she was speaking to uh, Maruna at one point, he said something that was so fucking raw, bro. Oh my, this is when I'm like, yeah, you top five. There is something my father used to say all the time. When insect, when snakes and insects show kindness, they're most likely hiding knives behind their backs. That's fucking bars. Yeah, he's, he, he, he's goaded, he's goaded. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of mix up happening. And a lot of there's a lot of moving plot points, a lot of uh, I, what I could appreciate with this series right now, by the way, it doesn't seem to be too hung up on good versus evil. Like morality is pretty skewed and it's pretty much in the gray area. Like the ethics of it, like yeah, slavery exists, nothing we can do about it. Kubera, stop paying attention, leaves. Let's just go to the hotel and do what we gotta do. You know, like stuff like that. And it's like no, like it's wrong. So, anyways, I am rambling. Thank you guys for listening. As of right now, I have Kubera at an 8 out of 10. Very good. While I do have some issues and I don't think it's fucking perfect, it's it's good though. I understand. And I'm excited for more. Uh, and yeah, hope, hope, hopefully we can... I, I do have some characters that I already want to make some videos on, but when I, when I fully catch up, we'll get there. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Yo... I want to thank you guys who actually ended up voting for Kubera to be the next thing that I kind of read on, on the channel and stuff um, with the poll because that was that was an experience. That was one. That was a ride. It's been a long time since I've really read something that had me that emotionally invested. And like when I leave my house and I go out and I'm doing things, I'm like thinking about it. Like, what has y'all up to? What's going to happen? You know, like, I'm thinking about these things just when I'm out doing regular, regular stuff or the point where sometimes I, 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 I got to read something and I just get, I, I pull out my phone and I'm reading, like, one or two chapters of the webtoon on the road, right? Not, not driving, but, like, I'm saying it's outside and stuff, right? So, there's that. But I got to, I know you guys saw me going through the ins and outs of that trial 
you know, your justice in mind and stuff. But I had, I came to a conclusion that uh, might shock some people that were like watching me. You know, I'm saying like, you know, there's a good reason. You know, Ash has a good reason. She's doing this for leagues and whatnot. Because there came a point where I'm like, if the power is in the name, I was thinking maybe it, like the power of Kubero's name was getting divided amongst the people with the name and as she was killing them she was actually giving that power back to Lee's. nah asha was on her own side from the fucking jump and she did nothing wrong <laughs> let's go we team asha i'm not mad at it because she was super honest she's like yo i treated you like a dick I was mean. I was I was trash to you. I stopped you from doing things and you just followed me around and did that fake smile. Like, listen, Asha's a piece of shit for that. I'm not even going to excuse that and not say that was evil or misleading or anything of the sort. But you got to take responsibility for allowing that to happen to you. We're going to talk about so many things. I don't even know how long this is going to end up being. But uh, like and subscribe. Uh, please... Hit the bell down so the Ghost of 13 month series doesn't get you. Stay notified. And last thing before I transition to the next thing, I'm, I'm going to have it like the first review that I did for Kubera. So it's in like one screen. You might see a couple of panels here and there popping up. But I'm just going to be talking. So if you, just, you could put this on in the background and just listen. You don't have to be like, I'm not going to be doing anything crazy with the editing. I mostly want to speak and get my thoughts out there. And I might be a little disorganized. And if anything I get wrong or I was a little off on or I misinterpreted, if it's not a spoiler feel free to correct me and you can supply me and supplement me with any outside information with interviews or anything of that if you've gotten to it because i haven't gotten to any of curry Mom's blog posts and things of that nature yet so man curry Gom is the best webtoon writer especially online webtoon or slash i guess maybe neighbor i'm gonna assume she's on neighbor too because it's from korea that i've seen and i don't think it's close not not even a little bit like she is her story to me is the personification in a sense if you will in like you know a narrative form of your patience being rewarded and plot threads that were seeded early come full circle let's talk about it curry gum curry gum curry gum you gotta say it three times put respect on her name that's uh that's payoff man i i can't remember the last time i felt like i should pay attention to every nook and cranny of the story because something as minor as just a paper a character is reading could be so important 66 chapters later and i appreciate stories like that it it makes it hard for me to just read it because now I'm, i could overthink something very simple or something simple i might not overthink or something so complicated i don't i don't think about it and it was like important like it can get in the way but i think the story does does it in a in a good way because man that was something else and i think a lot of the best stories that you experience will kind of make a hypocrite out of you and i think that curry Kong did that to me with asha but i'll get to that a little bit later i don't want to spend too much time on it now because i got i got a lot i got a mouthful because like i said earlier was she wrong now she was wrong but was she wrong <laughs> we gonna talk about it we gonna talk about it okay so I really like how this this part starts off season two because season two to me is the, like I said earlier a perfect example of long term payoff. I I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I didn't. I don't know if I really mentioned it, but there's there was a lot of lulls in this story where I was kind of like okay, like I actually no, I did mention it. I mentioned that I think it could be more efficient at times, but where I'm like, man, this you know 16 chapter stretch could have been seven. And I, there's a lot of times in season two where I really felt like that. I'm going to say around the arc where we got to about Frozen Tears, that's really when things started to pick off. The introduction of T.L. Rakan, Rakan, sorry, Rakan, yeah, really, really did a lot for me. I'm a big fan of all the priests and priestesses in the story for one reason or another, even if I'm not totally emotionally invested in T.L. Like Claude, I think, is like scheming on a different level right now. I don't really f with him as a priest, priest of death, but I do think that his character is has a lot of intrigue, especially moving forward. You guys know how I feel about Brilith. I love Brilith, and listen, we need to get her to be able to keep her vigor as high as possible because her constant worrying is not good. 
and it doesn't help Agony and with what he can do to help her and stuff. But we'll have to talk about that a little bit later. But that scene where Idiot Smith he said we're lovers and then just re reveal himself as Agony and stuff with the owner of the uh, the, the staff of fire. I thought that was so funny because he's like, okay, now what? I was like, what do you mean now what? You you made this decision like. He could really make some eight brain moves like that, but Agony actually comes across to me as one of those characters that can act airheaded and ditzy, but always really knows what's what what he what's going on and what should be done. And that that um posturizing as being a little bit more airheaded than usual actually helps him in the long run, especially when he has to kind of put his foot down, root it into the earth, and make a concrete decision for the betterment of whatever he thinks is the better best choice to make best course of action to take so those two are always dope but Tio swordsmanship and transcendentals not even a great magician it passed the test with that the triple nil you know you know um attribute and stuff and I saw a comment in my section say this and I think I might have asked it I might have asked this but was the reason that Asha revived Tio Rakan was because Kaz, Kubera's friend, actually has a triple nil attribute, which is extremely rare as far as I can remember and recall. Meaning that if you lose a priest with the capability of actually holding up this barrier in open space, you're going to have to seek out the next best candidate. Which means possibly with the news of a priestess dying and looking for a new candidate, it's going to be big news, right? And there's basically a chance that Kubera would have learned that Kaz was alive and Asha could not have that happen yet, which is why she did it. Let me know Let me know if there's truth truth and validity and credibility to that, but I thought that was very interesting because I'm like, these are like the kind of things where I'm like, you can just hide it in a regular panel. Oh yeah, Kaz is alive, yada, 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 and just not take in the triple nil attribute. Cause I didn't notice that, but when when I when I saw that comment, I, my mind went. Poof. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. That's crazy. We don't know yet. I mean, I don't know if, as of yet. Maybe they explain that later on. But to me, that's the most plausible reason for for her for her action to that point. But back to Tio. Tio really, really, really resonated with me really quickly. Uh, I guess I'll speak on like a couple of the other people real quick. Lutz, Lutz, L U T Z. I like him. Very pragmatic, very logic and reason, re logic and reason based. Never met at characters like that. Has expressed a lot of utilitarianism ideal ideals and whatnot. Um, sacrifice the few to save the many, or in the interest in the end, justify the means and stuff like that. I really like him. I talks about Brilith. Obviously, I'm I'm about to speak on Tio. Who am I forgetting? I'm, I think I'm forgetting somebody that I want to talk about. I spoke. Oh, well, wait. So this, was Saha count? Was Saha? Yeah, Saha. He was cool. Um. I don't know if we're getting somebody important, but uh, yeah, Lutz is, Lutz is cool. I like him. Anywho, T.O. really resonated with me because like Gandhi is there and he's, you know, on his undercover mission type beat or whatever. And sorry, guys, still can't stand this bozo. He's a fucking clown. I have no respect for him. Don't care about, uh, what's, her, what's his daughter's name? Uh, uh, Shankuntala, Shakuntala. I'm sorry. I know I'm butchering all these names. I wish I, I wish I wrote them down, but I'm ready here record and we're going to keep going. Shakuntala, Shakuntala. That's what I think it was. I, I just, I just, I, I have no investment in his story anymore. None, zero. I don't care because he let her die. He let her die. And I thought, like her introduction, the way she revealed she was the priestess of chaos, her trying to spice things up here and there. And listen, when she seen that man's monstrous sura form in the reflection of that like pool of blood, I don't remember what it's called. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um. But I was like, yo, the way she kept her composure and then did her research to the point when Sagara was like, hey, you know who this guy is? She's like, yep, he's this guy, blah, blah, blah. He's done this, X, Y, and Z. I'm like, she knew she had all the research, but based on the relationship she had, the dynamics, she tried to roll the dice and bet on the fact that maybe, maybe somewhere in his heart, he believed what he was doing, what was going wasn't wasn't right, and that, they, that she left a lasting impression on him in any shape or form and I thought that was truly something a little bit beautiful man like I I absolutely loved that it hurt me but like the, you know there's no rules that say you you um you must use magic in the magic exam if a fighter has earned an A plus uh rank in magic exam just by Swarmerson alone she does not worry have to worry about being a female because when she uh invited 
uh, Gandhi to her place. He's like, aren't you worried? We've seen like Gandhi actually being planetary, wrapping his sewer form around the entire planet at the time I didn't know. And then I had to see that motherfucking panel with her rapier in her neck. And I just hurt. It just hurt. You know what I'm saying? I was so fucking mad. I couldn't, I couldn't believe this happened to her. I, ah. Uh, it was just, it was just truly pain. Allow me to backtrack this a little bit. Just a, a couple of things I wanted to uh, touch on because I thought it was really cool. I thought Kurigan did a really good, was really smart with kind of starting off the season two with a bit more of a lighthearted tone back to that goofiness. Like, you know, Asha's just like a dickhead, but, you know, Lee's is just like that kind of um, bubbly spirit in the group. We have st second stage Yuta. And Ran and Asha dynamic has always been really good. Ran has gone up my rankings. He is such a great character. I love this dude. I think his brother is cool, but you can catch me hanging out with Ran, man. I love that guy. Their little competition about their um you know their magic score overall on the exam. That was really dope. I enjoyed that going back and forth. I spoke about Billith a little bit earlier, but you know, why do I have to hide you? Why can't I stand in front of you as like as like who we are together? Which to me shows that somewhat she has some feelings for him. I think Agni does actually love her in some shape or form. Um, as of right now, I could be wrong about that. But when he said we're lovers, and then actually revealed himself as I am the god Agni, owner of the staff of Agni and everything, that shit was so goddamn funny. I I, I cracked up. That was so funny. I'm like, and he's like, well, now what? What do we now look? What's your plan? Like I said, he strikes me as a character that tr plays a lot dumber than he is, but always has intention with anything he does. Sure, the intention might be to look at this dude as an idiot because he doesn't want people to think that that person is competent. And that's allowing him to move in silence. Like, everything I feel that Agni does has a pr intended purpose behind it. None of his actions feel meaningless, no matter how hard to judge they really are. And there was this one moment that I thought was cool related to the height of bondage when he got when when you when I think Yuta, the sword that he had, I think suppresses his his value from a transcend transcendental like standpoint. And when he gave that sword to Lee's, it actually um, suppressed her like overall value, which made the height of bondage go for Yuta instead. And there's just so many little instances of Yuta going out his way for her that I love, but Let's start to really tie into the year of N5 um, of on Planet Kart and what was going on in the small little breadcrumbs that she led. Because I gotta say this, I, was, I, I think I should say this now and not explain it and come up and come full circle later. But Kurigam's ability to make one moment of convergence have so many moving parts is phenomenal. What do I mean by that? I mean in one moment where a big confrontation could happen. I would sub I would surmise that the average narrative, I'm explaining it right, whatever. I'm, I'm explaining it. The average narrative would have like, hey, we built up these two rivals. Here they are face to face. And that is, for the most part, the crux of that moment, of that standoff, of that clash, whatever you want to call it. But with Korigam, she will have so many subplots moving at once that's going to tie, tie uh, uh, like tie up all of his loose ends to some degree in that climatic moment where i'm stressed about six different things this clash this build up that interpersonal relationship you didn't tell character x about situation a and now they're gonna know the truth about it it's like what the hell she's so good at that like that convergence that moment there it's just it's it's a tier it's just a, a tier but yeah, we're seeing things like Asha really take a glance at the N5 Cali Boom neutral bow, right? Then we see uh, Lee's, look at that picture of her father, Rao Lee's, you know, N5 um, fighter, rest in peace, whatever. Like all of these things. And we're just trying to like really, really, really learn about um, what was going on with that year and why so many people are attached to this moment around the great upheaval and everything. And hearing some stuff about the dad, about Lisa's dad was also really cool and intriguing. Like, um, I hope I, I'm not, I can't quote it verbatim, but it's like, you know, he had a great personality. He was extremely powerful and he was loved by a lot of people. And at a young age, he basically had anything he needed. 
but people who used to know him said that he really had a flaw which he didn't really have any like will or reason to truly live so he would just put himself in constant danger for the betterment of people like he didn't have any reservations of his own life and i i think that's important to know i think for some people you might think it's not a big deal especially since he's not alive anymore i think it's important to know because um for anyone doesn't know I'm, I, I'm a lifeguard like i've been like trained to lifeguard I'm, I'm, I, as of right now i would have to renew my certificate but what i'm saying is like i went through all the swimming classes of lifeguard and i've been an assistant instructor and one of the things that we learn like, well, the drowning victim, right? You don't jump right in and go, oh my God, you try to throw a flotation device, let them save themselves if they can. If not, you, jumping into the water to save them is the last resort. But we're taught to approach them with a method called, I think it's called reverse and ready or something like that, where we approach the drowning victim with our, almost like with our leg up, ready to kick them off you. Because what is a drowning person going to latch onto? Um... Uh, well, if, I, if I'm a lifeguard, I'm coming towards you, you're going to jump onto me because I'm trying to save you, correct? But if you're panicking and you're not under control and you're flailing and grabbing onto me, and I, right? And maybe, I, maybe I'm not that strong of a swimmer or whatever the case is, we can both drown. I have to value my own safety in life in order to save you. And that was the mistake that I think Raul made that ultimately led to his demise. So yeah now as a very very small side there was just one really funny joke that i really liked this is this is uh um tied to the flame mastery moment with brillith where where i liked where agony was speaking about certain things but like a bit before that with um what's the dragon's name again wow kasak right Kas kasak kasak when Agni said our team name is gonna be Dradra and the God, I'm like, bro, you did not just name yourself that shit. I was cracking up. Kubera is such a funny story, all things aside. And I think the best of the best of creative teams and writers can balance tone. Tone very well. I don't like when I get tonal whiplash in a story where I feel like this moment didn't have the appropriate level of urgency and stuff but being able to kind of make you laugh in high tension moments or serious moments but not take away from the gravity of that i think is a skill set that only some of the very best of writers have or content or not content creators sorry creative teams have um so yeah um, things like that but when he was trying to when they were explaining silent magic i thought that it was very interesting um a silent magic uh flame mastery a silent magic control fire no verbalized spell needed right so things like that but she basically he was um, explaining that people who can use that have essentially kind of forsaking some type of morality or i guess ethical code if you will um because he says the, la the desire for strength, lack of compassion for the enemy, a cold-hearted willingness to sacrifice everything else for one, for the sake of one of the objectives. These are the qualities that make a proficient, um, a magician proficient in silent magic. It has nothing to do with right or wrong of the objective. Even if it's for a righteous objective, there are times where you have to give up something humane during the process. So, and I thought that was worth that she really needed to hear because I feel like, um, Brilliant is an example of someone who's so good and so giving and wants to do the best for everyone in every instance where it's just not realistic for someone to be able to do that as a leader. You're going to have to make really hard, concrete decisions that will not benefit a certain group, no matter how much of a minority they are. Because I always argue that a lot of times when people are pursuing every in a pursuit of everything you will lose everything in life you need compromise compromise is very important so i like that he said that um to her i think it was important but yeah um ran ends up losing that deal and stuff but the the neutrality bow um that lee's that lee, rao used to have was very interesting because i was like okay this is really tying back up to all of that stuff like the end five year is becoming more and more prominent. I'm seeing it pop up more and more and I'm getting more and more curious about it. like the intrigue is building at a rate that I really like because I was already curious about it um back in the first season. Um not the bow itself, but that year and I said I said I meant, I meant the year end five. If I said the bow earlier, I don't know if I tripped on my words there. But like the shock of the bow landing from the ground was so thing that like it like the, the forest got destroyed and stuff. Like I think that was kinda crazy, um, all things considered. But anywho. 
when certain characters kind of try to go at Asha because Asha has always carried herself with this air of dominance of 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 condescension due to her level of savvy competence and just the ability to make the best decision but really those decisions were all for her so i always uh, I like that you know took the lives of 29 people like a magic accident which i think was probably one of if not the first time one of the first times i heard about it and i didn't really understand about that and when someone said that the suspicious thing about you is your defined affinity is known to be 515 but people who know the truth and it's like this is where i feel like doubt and suspicion on asha is truly beginning to get to get um cast upon her where i would say for the first season as much of a dickhead as she is i've never thought that she wasn't on our side but this is probably one of the first seedlings of of, of doubt being planted talk about hadiyama when she got hit with the hadiyama she thinned out i saw the chest come out i said i'm tweaking kubera looking kind of nice that was interesting to learn about a spell that could kind of take you to your final days and moments and seeing her look pretty, having the hat on and stuff, being a lot more thin. But the sadness of learning that no matter what, she's not going to live a long life because she has the appearance of somebody who's like, I don't know, maybe late 20s, at, at most 30 years old, it seems to me. Like she's not going to live a long life. And that was just like a sad thing to see because... Where constantly with any gods that have insight and have like you know knowledge of the future are seeing that one panel of her walking and saying yo you have a hard life ahead of you hard path ahead of you um but you might have a, a sliver of hope there and there the literal god of earth who is like your life is going to suck i can end it right now i can end it right now you know now i'm going to do something i i hope i never have to do again i'm going to give gandhi some credit I love what he had to say about Kubera when she was hit with the Hadiyama spell, right? And he said something along the line of, um, she's, she's like, why are you staring at me? And he's like, you know, you're really good looking. And she's like, oh, like, you know, you can't even see my face because she, she had the hat on and everything. And she basically said that, like, uh, pretty faces are a dime a dozen. And I got, a, I got a lot of, I got tired of them a long time ago. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, a line like that resonates with me just on a real and a real world level because it's like yeah i like that's something that i wholeheartedly agree with like extremely attractive and beautiful people are a dime a dozen but genuinely good down to heart human beings and people i know things not a human being technically he's a you know he's a sir and stuff but meeting people like that is rare and that's something that i value a lot more now i don't really care how good you great you look, think you are or look or whatever but it's like what do you bring to the table what have you accomplished what are you valuing right so there's stuff like that then hearing her saying i can't die yet i haven't even started getting on my revenge and everything oh it's just so much so much pain and sadness now we gotta talk about utah utah's growth utah's development all of that stuff and because I, th I, th I think yuta hitting his third stage was a bit of a jarring change for a lot of us because his personality while still having elements of it there's a lot of changes that happen and he seeing him just kind of hug and hold her i'm so happy it came before it's too late i love these moments because if you don't know this i ship them jatayu that's what, by the way the, the, the Taiyu thing was very very interesting why he had he that this name that he started using and stuff but the utah exiles is a ship that i like um i know it's like very basic and like you know in our face but i like it i really do i think it's really interesting because of how different they are um and i like agony x uh you guys could take gandhi x teal and shove it i don't want to see it but anyways just like the fact that he started to develop and now he's like, yo, <laughs> he walks out, you're a half. Um, we're going to have to get somebody to um, to vouch for him and everything. And it's like, he has some very shady desires, shady. And he's like, damn you, Mr. Kasak. This means I have to keep an eye on you because 
She's like, I'm going to go into the city and don't come out until you finish a book I'm going to read. Like, what book? It's called The Biology of a Sermon. He's like, no, stop it. And then that's when she put on the goddamn hat and clothing and everything. It was just kind of really funny because he started to show more, I don't know, adolescent, older, you know, guy tendencies. Like, he started to look at her more you know, sexually, if you will. Now, we we come to learn that for whatever reason, he just likes her differently than he does for anybody else, especially humans. But he still holds a lot of, like, Sora-related um, practices in the terms of, like... Okay, actually, no, this makes sense. So when she learns about the thing with, like, Rao and Lee's and everything, he's like, yo, I'm, I'm not sad that Rao Lee's is dead. I'm upset at the fact that it made you upset lees you know what i'm saying it's not the death of that human and i thought that was pretty cold and telling when he's speaking with uh, the god of earth kubera and he's like if she was already dead this would just be some corpse to him it's the fact that she's hurt and still alive that i'm pissed and they spoke about a little bit of those differences at the end of the of the second season when she finally learns the ability to kind of hear him and or because I think that her connection became so strong in that moment. And that's the only sort that she said that she could ever really hear speak. So I just think all that stuff is just absolutely incredible and phenomenal. So Frozen Tears, we see that Gandhi's crying and he's doing whatever whatever he's doing and blah 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 yada yada. Ugh, this fucking Gandhi guy. Can I talk about Arish real quick actually? I like her. She's really funny. She about her paper stacks and money and just and, pre and pretty much trampling on people. It's uh, it's very funny, but I I I really like her. But like like um, Utah's like fear of hurting Lee's being really really real and stuff. It's crazy. He even thought about just like taking her and going away with it. Like yeah, fuck all this. I'm gonna just take her and I'm gonna dip. And it's just he's getting more he's getting more dangerous in some ways. It's kind of scary. You'd be creeping me out. Something like Utah. I can't, I can't, I can't get down with this. You gotta do a little better. But let's talk about Frozen Tears a lot. Now, I don't feel the need to too strongly speak about Frozen Tears since you guys had literally seen me read it, react to it, and share a lot of my thoughts and opinions. But we got Tio back by the end of all that stuff. So, hey, we are here. I can, I will tell you this. If I live in this world, I'm putting my name on that do not revive me list. I think that uh, I don't... I personally am against um, messing with the dead and time travel, whether it's forward or backwards in time. So that's not a thing. That I, so I'll put, my, I'll put myself on that list. So if I pass away, you guys let me let me rest in peace, guys. I'm out of there. But um, interesting arc, Frozen Tears, him going to a Sura form and stuff, him and Agni's talking and conversations and everything. That was cool. Agni being like, hey, Kubera, you're still very sad. Like, why are you crying? You're not crying outwardly, but you're screaming internally. You're in so much pain and you're just not dealing with it. And I think that I said in a previous video that I was a little bit frustrated by that. Like, her lack of desire to take accountability, real onus, and agency of her own life and courses and stop catering to everyone so that she's simply not alone but i could understand especially even after just knowing hey i'm not gonna live long that loneliness is the thing that like it, it, it pained her the most honestly that's really similar to um to 25th band from tower of god i'm not gonna spoil anything but if you know anything I'm, uh, i know my tower god channel but maybe you are watching this video and you don't read tower of god and plan to get into it so i don't want to spoil it but Right? I would argue that um, Bam is a character that he fears loneliness too, more so than he feels, you know, uh, dying. So, interesting, interesting thing there. Just I wanted to point that out real quick. But I even like when bad things happen to her, or something happened to her, she wouldn't remember, or something happens and she will suppress it, or not address it, or not confront it, or oh no, that couldn't have, that couldn't have possibly been what happened. It frustrated me. I felt like Kurigan was using that as a crutch way too many times where it's like you rely on her being kind of stupid a stupid country bumpkin type character a little too much for my liking but i think i think i understood the reasoning for this because we had to have these emotions festering inside of her for a long time and really really have her bubble burst if you will and that and that air of reality that veil that and sh that barrier she's building up for herself to kind of keep her mind intact and her smile alive um she did that for a reason and then with the 
the culmination of the series of unfortunate events that happened to her at the end, these were the things that ultimately made her break and ultimately want to kill Asha. So I think it was actually in the grand scheme. Do you think I, like, I must still say, like, I still have to read this because one thing about, um, making the author really feel the passage of time and the effect of things are having of character, I think there's a place in that where it's like you want them to read it and feel it and not and not separate it. But sometimes I need authors to remember that we still have to go through this because I would imagine on a week to week basis this would have probably frustrated me a bit more. And by the way, just now that I'm on it, the fact that I could I could be I'll be caught up soon and and, and on a week to week basis with Kubera, I want to see how it feels to be a Kubera fan week to week. I'm excited for that too. So now we're starting to get to the stuff that you have all seen me react to on stream or on video and stuff. So I don't want to kind of harp on too many things. I want to get to the parts that matter to me the most. But the introduction of Saha, the president of the Eloth Magic Guild, was 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 incredible to me because. I know that he passed away and he's gone now, but I thought that he was a very powerful introduction. I don't mean I don't mean him being the number one ranked over a magician overall and being a double A and stuff. But it was sometimes a character comes and has such an important agency in the story immediately that they just become automatically really important and intriguing to me. There's a character in Death Note that a lot of people don't really like. That I really like because I felt that the story was gonna kinda stagnate or maybe slow down, but this character completely pushed the momentum of the story story immediately by kidnapping a family member of one of the character one of the main characters. That was Melo. So Saha to me is very interesting because he pretty much is the strongest magician ranking one at least on paper and one of the only magicians that we think probably could, is competent enough to actually beat Asha straight up but immediately goes after her for her crimes and what she did. Wasted no time. So now what character that we all are familiar with is basically under the fire which is fantastic. He's, his, his thematic role has run out and he obviously is gone now, but while he was in the story, he was so important, especially the ties to Lorraine, and the Lorraine thing was pretty interesting too. But anywho, seeing him use the um, the life source system for Planet Willar and stuff was cool, because it reminds me of, uh, is this Cerebro? What's it called actually in X-Men? When Professor Xavier puts on the helmet to find all the mutants. I love that shit. So that thing is really cool. We kind of... So it's kind of talking and diving into that the 29 deaths and stuff, which we learned later. There was way more because tons of Suras or Halfs were actually named Kubera. But since they're not really considered human and whatnot, if you kill a Sura, you're not going to be tried under the weight of the law itself, which is crazy. This is a moment where I struggle with Lutz, Lutz L-U-T-Z, um, a little bit, um, a little bit additionally. That's Kako's man's, but... Because I thought he was completely emotionless in a sense, but I realized that he's just one of those people who are extremely pragmatic, logical, reason, reason based, and I and I don't hate people like that because I think they have a I think they're important to have contrasting ideals and ways of getting things done because he's pretty much expressed a lot of utilitarianism um, beliefs, like you know, you know, you sacrifice the few to save the many, if. You have to blow up building B that has a hundred people in it because somehow blowing up that building will allow a thousand people in the adjacent building to live. That's the decision you make, and I and I and I can get I can get down with characters like that, especially if they're talking to somebody who's very emotional based. Because I think an emotional based person, a logic based person, if both of them are level headed and truly want to solve a problem, they'll meet in the middle. Life is about compromises, so. Yeah, Lutz is cool, you know. For the sake of the people who are alive right now, we have to bury the unpleasant past of a brilliant sorceress because her skills are more important than her ethical code. And I was like, okay, goddamn, that's crazy. Then he kind of extends that a little bit to Utah because Utah unfortunately had a moment where he, he hurts Lee's. She, they have a little smoochy smooch. I really love that moment. It's so cute. I shipped them so hard, dude. You have no idea. And a powerful Rakshasa who is actually nice towards people that we can have on our side. We're just going to have to be like, we're lucky that she has the Golden Knight. So as long as she has vigor in her body, she will heal. Utah is too useful 
to to shut him because of this one girl and i'm like that's so fucked up but could you fault that line of thinking they're under attack by sorrows that was all the time it's just oh uh. now let me let me explain the moment where i naya hemmings first doubted asha it wasn't the moment i brought up earlier even though I think that's maybe one of the first, there's not, there's probably in hindsight if I when I when I reread it I'm gonna see a lot of the stuff. I love rereading a series this well constructed, with with the foreknowledge you have because knowing everything and revisiting it is going to let you see, a lot of things you wouldn't have noticed now that you have the truth or and the knowledge. So I can't wait to revisit it. So there's probably an instance in the first season, but. To me, it's when we went to Arrow Plateau and we learned that all the all the spells that Kubera had been learning about the God of Earth, the Earth spells, do not work here. And I'm like, why did she do that? Why? Now, I'm suspicious. <laughs> I'm suspicious now. I'm suspicious. I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna lie to you. I got suspicious. Didn't want to doubt my girl. Um, by the way, Arrow Plateau brings back my my. She actually she's actually been dropped a second favorite. If anyone doesn't know, um, I D. Aidy is my second favorite character right now. Somebody told me that, um, kind of spoiled a little bit to me that her and Tio are connected a bit more. So she can rise back up to first by the end of this. Like, I'm, I, I will have a top five, six, six characters or something video once I'm done with all this stuff. But Asha's right, I, I thought, I thought one right now. But yeah, my girl Aidy came through. She thick, she got the dump truck. Lorraine or someone said that she took up like two seats. Like, ooh, she got the wagon? Let me stop. Anywho. Jatayu, after hurting um, Lee's, goes to his brother, Maruna, which was cool. They're seeing the light, what's going on, working with the snakes. We learn about Simpanti, a fifth stage Rakshasa from the Garuda clan, and her connection to Maruna and her training. And this is when we learn about the Soras and how they grow and how they evolve and like the certain conditions that have to be met or like get and then feeding into that condition by like giving you experience points how to for you to evolve i thought that was really cool um seeing how that works so when maruna got put through the ringer with simpanti for him to get to his fourth stage and everything so that was kind of sad to see a little difficult to watch but hey you got strong nice and powerful there but those two fighting as brothers and whatnot that was a little bit sad and then um, there's a moment that I probably glossed over a little bit, but seeing Lee's cry about Yuta, uh, believing he was a half, but everybody wasn't telling her the truth. I believed everybody, and then and, and being able to accept him, I think was was a good moment and important. But I I think that was one of the very few instances where I actually believed that not telling her based on her hatred she had for Maruna, Maruna being Jatayu's brother. Like, you see what I mean? I said convert, like, like, like one little thing like that could cause so many things to go wrong because Yuta likes, please, please likes Yuta. Maruna destroyed her village. Like, like it's, it's mind blowing. It's good. It's good stuff. You can't get mad at it. Any moment of introspection that Lee's has throughout this fucking um, second part is really hard to look because she, you really start to see how much she hates it being alone. You know what I'm saying? And it just hurts. It just hurts. And then seeing Rant, um, Yuta talk about like, if she was just a dead corpse, just a dead corpse, it wouldn't really bother me. It is what it is and stuff. It's just, it hurts, dude. But anyways... Let me really start talking about the stuff that I want to speak about because again, a lot of this stuff you guys had did see me react and I did speak a lot about my reaction to stuff. I do had more time to think about it, so some of my stuff have been a little bit tempered and changed, but um definitely think that Kubera's ineptitude and stuff was all for the culmination of a big moment so i know i harped in one video about her being too incompetent and forgetting stuff and not acting on stuff that she knows to be true but doesn't want to be true i think i think that was actually well handled for the most part so again nitpick but um asha the trial and everything the 29 people, the half she killed, all the names. Like, as this trial is going on and we're reduced to uh, the priestess Mirha and everything, I really like her. I didn't, I didn't trust her at first, but she just she was somebody who was somewhat used by Asha, knows how it feels, and lost her innocence in that way. So she can get into the mindset of that. And seeing all the stuff that she has written down and what she knows about the situation or what she thinks she knows about it 
was crazy because I think here's the thing that really made me really realize like no, Ashley is completely self-serving. But they didn't really hide it, which is why I can't get mad at it. I'm a, and I'm going to use this example. James Harden is an NBA player who used to play for the Houston Rockets at OKC Thunder, who's currently on the Brooklyn Nets. And he was known for something that a lot of people don't like, which is basically baiting the referees to call fouls. In basketball, you can't really, like, touch the player too much or too forcefully. Only the ball. Or if you contest a shot, you can only go up straight up verticality. But James Harden will, like, kind of tangle his arms into people and, like, basically initiate the content itself and force the person, the referee, to call a foul. Do you know why I don't get mad at James Harden for doing this? Because the refs enable this behavior. You're rewarding it. Lee's, is, Lee's not taking agency and control of her own life as, as Asher was mean to her, just didn't want her to learn nothing, was a dickhead to her at every turn and had tried to kill her on multiple occasions and you still sticking around? You cannot put all of that on Asha. At some point, what you were complicit in this. I'm not saying you weren't a victim, and I'm not saying that the blame isn't like 70-30 Asha. But take onus for what happened to you because you didn't have to. You didn't have to do this. You didn't have to follow her. You chose to do this. So I, I believe that kind of justifies Asha in a very, very shitty way. Just not make her a good person or nothing, but I, I can't be upset about that because I'm saying, again, was, do I like what James Harding is doing? No, that's not basketball, and it's kind of nasty to see, and it doesn't even work in the playoffs, but why wouldn't you do something that's rewarding you? You're getting free throws out of it, so I understand. You having her around benefits you in certain ways. Now, it wasn't the way that we thought where, like, oh, she felt that as Rao's daughter, she could be a capable fighter. It's like, no. I guess Asha had some type of reverence and respect to some degree about Rao, even though she claimed that she killed her, killed him. That when the Kubera that she came to, 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 to finish off in this place, said her name was Lee, she was like, oh, fuck. Oh, here we go. So she kept her around as long as she could literally physically tall and mentally tolerate it because now you've messed up her own plan so now you're a liability if she can't win no one can so yeah oh <sighs> that was crazy that trial was really really thin because like i said earlier i really thought that her killing the other kuberas was making the power of name basically only be, a be basically by killing every single kubera and leaving one the power of name would be the strongest in Kubera Lee's. I thought that was the goal. But it turns out that, that she had a deal with Visnu. And with every Kubera with the power of name she killed, he would increase her divine, in, uh, divine affinity. And let's talk about what I believe to be... No, I'm not going to go that far because there's some, I've summoned image comics that I've read that are very good. But in terms of a character's backstory arc being told in a short span of time, so four chapters, four episodes, if you will, which was just called Asha, I thought was phenomenal. Because I thought when I, I think that was the moment that made me able to accept everything that she did, despite me not really liking them, because I really do want the best for Kibera. Asha's viewpoint and way of looking at the world is just fundamentally different from most people. You will never truly understand her perspective because somebody that's going to see their entire people, a, a lot of people they know die and, and go away and be like, yeah, I gave you a wish, but instead of bringing back the people you claim you want revenge for, you're seeking power. Why didn't you ask for your mom to be revived? Because you don't care. What you're mad at is the fact that the brilliant future that you had is now taken from you. And you want revenge. You want to win. And seeing how kind of an emotionless, not emotionless, but you know, not emotion driven, not emotion goal oriented, not emotionally idealistic, just a, a much more calm, calculated individual. There's people like this. They have no use for people who are like, emotional and rah-rah and screaming and running around where it's like yo being calm and collected being reasonable being logical is the move we use facts we use statistics we use proven um human history we use precedence we don't just you know act in our emotion and feels 
she's just one of those characters and i think i just truly understand understood that but what actually was really mo the most interesting thing to me about the this new stuff was she actually knows everything to some degree that's going to and supposed to happen especially very important decisions and things she has to do for her to win this because even sagara is aware of this and asha had always always from the get-go presented me as a character that had knowledge of future events now i actually believed in my head my tin hell my tin hail wow tin foil theory was that asha had actually either physically seen the future or been to it and i thought somehow the hot new this new stuff being a time related spell and when we're going through, she kept using it and trying it. I thought she was trying to somehow send herself back in time or, or learn how to time travel. I really did believe that. Now, what she ended up doing to me, I thought was far more interesting. Kind of giving her a punishment that removed her from existence. So that she could extend her all ready. Because Hadi, Hadi Yam was used on her and she's still very young. She wasn't going to live very long. So in order to actually make it to the year that she needs to be alive in. To get what she needs done. She abused a time spell until she had to be punished for it. And removed from existence. Do you guys understand what kind of fucking 6D chess this is? Everyone is playing fuck. Not even playing chess. They're playing in the dirt with sticks, and she's playing six-dimensional chess. It's just, it's just not fair. Homura is a character in Puella Magica Madoka that had had a, essentially experienced a moment in time so many, so frequently that she became so numb to it that even in pursuit of doing things which is supposed to help a person she cared about. It's hard to see that. There's no empathy with her, really. And she's very drained and devoid of, like, light in her eyes. But when you get the backstory, you can see why this happened. And I felt like when I got it with Asha, I truly understood, I understood this. She's like, I have a goal so important to myself, I literally don't care about who I have to trample on. Because if there is any character that I believe that Asha had shown even an ounce of respect towards or reverence to, it was it was Rao, to the point that she didn't even want to immediately body like she said out of any Kubera that I could have killed right now, you're the easiest. You're not a threat to me. You're weak. And I'm like, dang. That has to hurt to see. I don't know, man. But then the story of the season comes full circle with it failing, Kubera failing again and saying you're just fucking useless. Like, see, I proved my point. But if I can't win, no one can no one can. Lorraine dropping into her saying, you brought Sa into this. You're just a monster. You're trash. I shouldn't have believed in your justice. I shouldn't have believed in mine or whatever. Oh, long term payoff. Yuta and Lee's finally making that connection. Her being able to hear his voice and him siding with Asher. Her feeling alone. Her taking everything off. Just take the store. Take the height of bondage. Whatever the fuck. Take my body. Kill me too if you want to. Walking away saying, please don't go. Him saying, this is all I can do for you. And then she could hear it. And now they're together. And then we'll see how things move on for from that from that moment. But I have, with this season being as good as it is, the way that I think season one is such a strong, strong foundation and pillar of support for the second and, th and second and obviously third seasons that I think that I ha I don't I think I had Cooper at an eight out of ten. I gotta bump it to a nine right now. It's a nine. It's at a nine for me. It's getting to that masterpiece level where I'm like I think it's I think by the end of reading I'll probably have it at a ten. When I rank something a ten, it doesn't mean it's perfect. It means it means one of two things or both of these things. I think it's a masterpiece, not perfect. A masterpiece or two, whatever I believe the intended purpose of the narrative was was fulfilled or completely achieved you were successful in doing that so if i am reading a comedy series that's like 10 chapters but i legitimately thought it was hilarious it's a comedy series the point is to make me the reader laugh i laughed a lot it's a 10 because the intended purpose of this narrative was fulfilled 
And I feel like what she is doing with 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 Kubera is she's she's pretty much hitting all the nails at the right time. So let me stop talking because I've been speaking for a long time. Look forward to more Kubera videos, of course, season three stuff, some season three reactions and everything. But phenomenal season. The the downfall of Kubera Lee's innocence throughout the second season was powerful. Because it really resonated with me. Even as somebody who can support Asha's actions, I don't like what she did to her. And I'll, oh, and I have to, I, I can't, I can't leave without speaking about the I won Kubera, King of Snakes, all of that stuff. Kubera's life would have been next to perfect or without hardship and peril if Vishnu did not intrude. And, and and basically she'd not kill Rao to not Rao, Rao go back to the family, which sent her life down this path. We heard a lot about past, taking this path a lot from certain characters and decisions and whatnot. Here's what I find interesting about that though. Is there a way to forcibly change your destiny? Because what I, I know this, Bear with me. This is going to sound crazy, and I know it's probably stupid as hell. Just let, just, just let me say this, because if I'm wrong, tell me be wrong. I don't mind being wrong. Could Kubera, with the help of a god or something, be able to switch to a different path that doesn't lead her down this dark descent where Asha has, you know, the dominant role, if you will? Is there a way for that? Is there a time travel way? A god can help you? Oh, if you do these six things before, you know, your lifespan runs out, Asha will actually blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. All right. So, we'll see. Let me start bab stop babbling. Thank you guys again for, uh, for listening. If you got this far, let me know what you guys thought about anything I had to say. Um, is there anything you thought of, any character you thought I forgot to highlight, anything you thought that was really important? No, I didn't talk about Rand enough. Hold on. We ain't stopping. Here, here comes the Rand segment. Rand and his brother are so fundamentally different and I love that. Because Thing gets more respect than him and Rand, um, and shit, what's the fucking girl? The human of pure blood that he likes? Layla? Lila? No. Yes? Yes? I don't know. I'll have the, I'll have the name here <laughs> on screen. Their relationship building up was awesome, and like Lee seeing her, 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 like feeling more left alone because Rand really, really put put himself out on a limb for her a lot of the times. Like, tried to help her get her new clothes. She was looking beautiful in that dress, smiling and stuff and everything. And just like, he was such a good person. He's such a good dude. I just mess with him. Like, he's honestly a solid ass nigga. Like, can't go wrong with this dude, Rand. I, I, I'm going to say this here now. If anyone is a Kubera reader who hasn't seen the third season at all to some degree, I'm about to spoil something. I'll uh, come back in like 10 seconds. But like, there's a three, two, one. Here is the season three spoiler. He has children now with her. The twins. He living. Oh, he married. Like, I love all that. Like, seeing his seeing his character arc and his growth, his journey. Seeing his, uh, oh, the lifespan thing. Seeing him being that oblivious to her liking him and... The love, I love romance. I'm such a romance merchant. I love it. I need it. I want it more. Give it to me. Romance is it. But I, I especially love romance in stories that I don't, where I don't feel like it's the focal point. Where like the story is about, um, a CEO who doesn't know how to run his company, but he also falls in love with some porn in the story. You know, I, I like when it's an important theme, but not the the main focal point. But if it's the main focal point, I'm still having a good time. All right, I'm gonna leave it there though. I do have some videos on season two I wanna make and stuff, but I'm actually gonna catch up. I'm just gonna catch up completely, and then I'm gonna start talking about certain characters. Because trust me, that Asha video was coming. And yeah, and Kubera too. Thank you guys for listening this long. Y'all have yourself a mighty fine day. Um. Any Kubera fans that, you know, you see this video that you think will like it, please share it with them. I appreciate that. Um, I want to grow, I want to grow, I want to see if I can grow a decent following of Kubera fans here on the channel because this is something you're going to see me cover on a week-to-week -week basis when I catch up. I'll be live reacting, with, live reacting to it weekly. 
having character analysis videos, discussions, and all of that. So stay tuned, guys. Stay tuned. Curry gum. Well done. So in the same way and vein that I've done the Kubera reviews, I wanted to take this time to speak about, I believe it was 13 different chapters specifically of the special Kubera chapters that came out for like season three. I, I believe it was during some type of break or hiatus, whether it was a self-imposed one or one after the second season. But I want to talk about these chapters because I actually found them to be very eye-opening, fantastic in their own right. And one thing that I truly appreciated about them was that a lot of times when I get these extra chapters, they're usually something that's very silly and not important enough that you have to put too much uh, stock in it. So you could actually just ignore it for the most part. But what I would say with these recent, these, these Kubera ones is a lot of the times when I get that new information from a side story or something, there's something that I would, I would argue it conflicts with in a major fashion where every extra tidbit here that I got, extra information, a little more detail about a side, about a story that I, I may have not known the other side to, the other side of the story, um, which is a current arc in Kubera, I don't think it conflicts with anything. I think it only enhances characters, enhances moments, enhances scenes. And I think that is a very important thing that every Kubera fan should read. If you have not read it, I will have a link to those chapters in the comment section below. Let's talk about it. I do want to preface by saying that I'm obviously a new Kubera fan and I haven't revisited all the material in its entirety and I haven't been with it long standing like some of you guys are where I'll kind of kind of consider you guys more like Kubera historians. So perhaps it's just that I'm unable to notice it. So I'm, I, I don't want I don't want I don't want that to not be a part of what I'm saying here, but I truly I trust in Kurigam's writing ability and ability to plan short, mid, and long term in terms of the plot points and characters that she comes up with. So I am going to go in good faith and believe that I am, at the very least, mostly correct on this part. Like the video, subscribe if you're new here, and hit the bell to stay notified, okay? These chapters were fantastic, but Kurigam is mean because pain. Pain. Wish did not. You didn't have to do that with me, with Wish. I didn't ask for that. There's, there's just no reason. You see this picture here of Jatayus, aka Yuta, kissing her and stuff like that. Whole, that whole scenario really reminded me of a bunch of comics and things that I really like. Like when Superman had um, I can't, why can't I remember the name, this, the name of the thing, the star on the starfish on his face, the alien parasite thing, that made him imagine the life that he wanted, like the like like, like the, the the actual life that he truly wanted, not the reality that he's currently in, and it's like this um mental psychological transcendental that was that they were using on her to make her and, and utah kind of live this fake life it's just like i didn't ask for this that's just hurt my feelings for no reason but it's extremely vital and important because not only do we kind of get more insight to what happened in the sorrow realm during those seven years and we get a a, a deeper look at how they have kind of grown but the pain and torment that they both go through through the fact that they can't properly be together and how that bleeds somewhat into Kubera's, um, who leads this kind of personality and whatnot to the point where she's like, she, I respect, one thing I really respect about her is she, no matter how painful the real world is, no matter how painful reality is, like Thanos said, real, reality is often disappointing to MCU Thanos, obviously. Um, she accepts it. Or will or will or kind of chooses to deal with it. You could there was definitely a point of denial with her for a long time, but she actually will just be like, no, it's not real. I don't want it if it's not real. And I respect that because that's hard to do, especially nowadays in our current society. No people aren't like that. People are okay with being quote unquote blue pill. They'll just be in the matrix. Put me in the matrix even though I know I'm being a human battery. And it's like, no, she would rather be like Neo and Trinity and Morpheus and actually see that the machines are using us as batteries. And I and I have tremendous respect for that. 
especially in these times. But speaking of some of the other ones, I have to say this because this was this was probably one of the things that shocked me the most. Other than, I mean, me getting my feelings hurt with Wish. I thought seeing Rand's older brother Lutz, Lutz, however you pronounce his name. I I say Lutz because like Butts or Larry Butts from like like a uh, Ace Attorney, so I say Lutz sometimes. But maybe it's Lutz. I don't know. I I ain't never ever seen him act like that before. Like it was literally I'm I'm like, yo, you're you're actually a lot more similar to Rand than I realized. He just has the sense of duty, and 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 enough you know like just enough brain because he's pragmatic enough that he knows when he has to put on that professional aura, that uh to take to take onus and take control of things and just be a thinking man. But on his leisure time, on his off time, when he doesn't have to do that, he's a lot more similar to Rand than we realize. And I just thought that was very interesting because it didn't, it wasn't jarring to me. It didn't conflict with the character that I have seen and known throughout the narrative because I know sometimes you could be the most professional person in the public eye. And then when you get a chance to let your hair down, so to speak, at home, you might be a little slovenly. So like, I like, I like, I like that. So. It kind of shows me like the career man versus the man at home, so to speak. But her, her, Rana and him talking about like him having those like Yaksha clan, you know, being into certain ears and stuff like that. That was super duper dope. But then seeing Rana actually get the anti-aging um, bunny ears, if you will, or cat ears. I can't remember exactly what it was uh, off the top of my head. But that was really funny too because not only was it actually a fetish that tied into Ran 2 as another member of the Yaksha clan as a half, it was a quarter, sorry. Ran is a quarter, my bad. But it was just really funny because it's like... <laughs> The to everything about that was comedy gold to me and it i always enjoy laughing so for me that whole discussions that they were having at the beach and everything it was just really funny because she's like wait you talk about me but like she obviously likes Rand, and then just that whole ordeal with the ears that was really cool so kudos to Kurigan for that one because I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. We kind of started off with a little bit of the stuff with Saha. That was good. Deserved better than Lorraine. Lorraine's a clown. I'll never respect her. Fuck Lorraine. Um, and we learned a lot more. A little, we learned a little bit more about Minaka. Shukant, Shuk, uh, Shukantala a little bit here. About some of the stuff that they had to go through with Gandhi or whatever. We, we got a little bit more insight into some of the different suras. Some of the suras we haven't seen too often. That was special. Um, by the way, th there's this one part during the, the conversation they were having about like boyfriends and girlfriends and betrothals and stuff like that. And he's like, Amenity, are those your last words? That was really funny. Uh, but yeah, we even got some insight into Maruna as a younger man. And we actually know that Maruna now has probably had a crush, if not was in love with Simpanti to some degree. Uh, I mean, it's heavily implied, and I'm going to assume that there was a romantic, romantic, um, care on his side at least before she forced her way to the next stage and maybe changed in a lot of ways but it was very interesting because maruna's not a character that you would associate really with love he seems to kind of be a true slave to the sura nature and the way that things work and the hierarchy of suras in the world itself with the gods and fifth mind gods and primeval gods and all of that however again what really shocks me with these revelations in these moments is that not only are they not they're completely believable, it doesn't actually clash with the current version of the character that I'm used to. I believe this. This is very believable to me and very well thought out, very well presented. Whereas their growing relationship from him in a, in a younger form and seeing her chain and this, that, and the third, I'm like, yo, that was very, very impressive. So, again, these special chapters are probably something that maybe a lot of people might write off as just, yo, it's just like extra content, but it's like, no, we really do dive into some very important moments here. One of them being one of the versions of Brilith with, that didn't have a name and Agni actually running into her, but not realizing this was one of the versions of his everlasting betrothals which which was fascinating in its own i didn't realize that in the moment it was it was a lot of you guys that helped me i helped clear that up but that's fascinating and agni almost felt to some degree like he had cheated on her seeing kubera just go after after yuta getting uh, by area vata just hitting her over and over and she's just healing up healing up i'm no more i'm, I'm all over the place i'm sorry but like 
like that that hurt to see i want to i want to kind of close that on unwish i forgot about that part but like okay now sierra the the priestess of the earth is very funny to me priest of the earth is very funny to me because he had one of the most jarring character changes of all time that's completely believable in every facet but we got to actually see there before they use before chandra and agony do that thing with the crystals um and he kind of gets that that extreme character change you get to see a lot more insight into how he is and how he was and even on a mission and how his, he was struggling with his vigor and how they were treating him and whatnot and it's again a giant contrast to how we've how we know him now now and then but it was nicer it was really important for me to get a little extra insight to how sierra really is and was before that happening now he's with asha and doing their thing because now i truly understand him a lot more and the journey and the, and, the, and and why the change is so kind of fucked because now that's just not the same person you feel me so I think that if you haven't read this, it's important. Definitely check it out. I think Gaze is really good. I liked Wish a lot, among some of the other little side stories in there. And I, to me, it's like those 13 chapters, if you will. Not necessarily 13 story arcs, but 13 chapters. A couple of these were more than one. Like 9, 8 out of 10. 9 out of 10 for me, sorry. I'm about to say 9 or 9.5 out of 10. Like, absolutely phenomenal definitely check it out if you if you if you have a chance to i will have the link there in the comment section below but also speaking a little bit on the brillith part real quick just because it's interesting seeing the different versions of brillith is also extremely important because we know about the the old the ancient human soul and how it works right and having seeing some insight into the harshness that brillith had to deal with through her, her many incarnations adds to the believability of her attitude today in season three as neo brillith has come out through you know the current brillith through and then is doing what she's doing and how she had presented herself how she doesn't really mess with certain people and the selflessness that she would have for the betterment of the universe due to the fact that she spent a long time in the universe even if it's through, through reincarnation so to speak and understands it's important and is still a caring person even though the methods are a little darker now because of solid magic this down the third but i'm rambling fantastic chap set of chapters please check it out if you have the chance when you get the chance to and curry gum stop being mean i, I don't i don't like this pain. <laughs> this pain this is pain just puts up through so much pain i wouldn't say unnecessarily but jesus christ man all right guys have a good day i'm gonna be out here That was an experience. That's one. This is one hell of a journey. The journey is obviously not completed. We're still reading it. We still have much more to go. But I have to just say that this has been an absolute treat reading the series from start to finish, start to the current. It's been great. It's, it's one of my favorite things. It is currently my favorite webtoon. As you guys know, I think I made an announcement already, and. I have a lot of things in the future that I want to do, including kind of combining the various reviews for one big, proper, like almost complete series one. But as of this review, deconstruction, analysis, video, whatever it is you want to call it, I am on Enemy Part 4, Season 3, 2004, uh, 2004? 204. So that's just how far I am as of right now. So obviously, Season 3 is not completed. I don't know if there will be a fourth season. I don't know if this is the last season. So you have to just go up until this point in time. But yeah, this has been an absolute treat. It's been really great. And I just want to thank the community. <laughs> I want to thank Kako for rigging this. The, um, the poll when i said what webtoon should i start covering more often on the channel but the community has been really great um very 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 nice very welcoming i appreciate you all it's really good to be here i think the discussions have been really really dope i hope to be able to bring you a lot more discussions weekly especially at some point but you will owe me therapy money i need therapy after this this shit is good it hurts though it hurts good but it hurts I think I've been hit by a couple of psychological transcendentals. I need you guys to pay for my therapy. Yeah, that's what I'm going to need from you guys. But all seriousness, season three to me has been like 
everything season one and two has been building up to. I said season two was 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 like long term payoff. Well, um, this is like even better, and so many things happened, and I love that. As we're getting further, sure there are more mysteries and more things that we're um going to have to explore, but we are getting answers for things that we are already kind of pondering. I don't like when we get to a certain point in the series and I feel like they're just piling on more and more intrigue and mystery. There comes a point where you need to start answering questions and I appreciate that season three does that. Sure, they might throw in some new stuff, but they are answering things that we've been inquiring and thinking about from season one and two. So without further ado, let's hop into this review. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell to stay notified. And listen, our community is not that big right now. It's pretty small. Let them know I'm the guy. I'm here. I'm here talking about Kubera doing what i can do i'm trying to carry this community on my back if i have to i got broad shoulders i can handle it tell your friends share the video let them know i'm out here oh lord where does one even begin when talking about kubera season three i think the only appropriate place to truly commence is the artistry the improvement the overhaul of the artwork you can tell that kurigam has been trying hard to improve the overall aesthetic of the webtoon and I think she's done a fantastic job of that. I'm very impressed. I think seeing Agni, Umbrella, and a couple of characters kind of off rip in that new art style hits you. Like, oh, it could be a little jarring because you know it's not typically how some characters are drawn. But the detail is great. And you can tell that she's still trying to improve on her artwork, which I appreciate. I would argue that a lot of creative teams, writers, mangakas, whatever... If they have a strength, they tend to lean into that strength. And Kurigama's strength obviously lies more so with the pen, you know, than the brush, I would say. She's an extremely talented writer. You've heard me praise her the high heavens about her ability to converge events together with like eight different moving parts that are all equally as interesting as the main conflict. Very, very talented writer. But I respect that instead of using it as a crutch like okay i'm gonna just lean into my writing and my writing only because this is the thing that i do best i'm also going to continue to strive to improve the artwork that i make i put in this story and that ties into combat this is not a this is not a meathead series this is a uh i almost said power fantasy did you say is it a it's like a tragic romance i would call it a fantasy romance right a lot of that is part of the story this is a, this, this story has a really big romantic theme in it and i'm a huge fan of romance if you guys don't know i'm a bit of a hopeless romantic i won't lie to you it's, it's hard out here man. It's, hard. <laughs> it's hard out here man but um yes the fact that i would say that kurigam has really improved the combat the fighting and it happens more frequently i honestly would argue that it was the thing that the series was truly missing i i have to admit that for the first two seasons especially while in season two there was a lot more action even though it was still pretty sparse and, sp and it happened sparingly i thought that's this was something the series was missing i didn't need it to have a focus and have a lot of combat in it but for characters who live for these millions and millions of years and can like wrap themselves around the planets a couple of times and destroy entire solar systems and things of that nature i'm like y'all need to start fighting my dude like y'all can't be this powerful y'all got gods promethea gods all these cereals and nasticas and everyone being mad strong these humans and magic and stuff and it's like y'all need to throw some more goddamn hands baby because it is just too. It is just too. They're too powerful, and it's, to me, it's too important. And I like that this se this season. I would say to me has the most combat in it, and a lot of it is nothing incredibly over the top, but enough for it to work. I enjoy just seeing two big kaiju suras going at it, just you know, wrestling. That shit is raw. So, kudos to her there, cause she, a lot of improvement. Now, you kind of get her, her showing off that off-rip with Lee's actually using the Sword of the End and, oh, the Golden, is it Golden Knight? The Golden Knight, um, like the bracelet, and like in tandem with, uh, I believe she's riding on Kasak in the Sura Realm. Like, it's almost like she was immediately excited to say, look, I've been working on the combat. Look at what I'm doing. And it was great. And to see Lee's overall improvement as, as well was a treat. Kind of seeing Maruna um, standing around, kind of getting fed up with Gondhavra. You get you see my girl Irie getting followed around by Asura, and then just a lot of things that are happening really quickly. Like it's honestly, 
a very nice treat to me in the sense too when it's, the season starts we start a little bit wholesome i do think that tone shift is a little bit intentional where it's like oh the kids all oh, look ran around married yada yada because you know she's she's mean she's just gonna hurt us after she <laughs> after she gives us what we want oh love and romance and nice things yeah and she's like and it's like you kind of you kind of have one eye open like all right when is when is the punch coming like she's about to hit me in the gut at some point so Anyways, yeah, all the priests get like a, um, for the most part, get some type of letter, some type of, some type of summoning. So, you know, like it's started to build that intrigue for what's happening currently right now, which I really much appreciate. And, um, let's dive into one of my favorite characters. You know, I'm a priest merchant, priestess merchant. Let's talk about Tio and the Tio Rakan who used to completely trust and help strangers. She died seven years ago with, with the God Havre on the Frozen Tears event and, how all of that led to the Hotney Visnu thing. I, you guys hear me I'll, I'll always kind of, it's, it's funny because you guys make fun of me. Like for somebody who doesn't want to be on the do not resurrect list, I seem to have a thing for women who are uh, been resurrected, right? There was just something about it that I didn't trust. I'm not a person who believes in quote unquote um, reanimation or life after death in the sense that i mean i believe in the afterlife but i don't believe that you can really come back from from death i don't believe in that um so and honestly i truly believe that if my time on this earth is done it's, it's done it is what it is you gotta you gotta let me go um and move on and do the best you can if the situation is really that dire where it's like oh, maybe i was the only person who can lead us to salvation here like and it's, I'm, I was some military leader or something i kind of get it but still you gotta move on so when we learned about so Idy and Tio are two of my favorite characters, and learning that Claude and Idy, well Claude actually was the um I, I believe he was young was he younger and I, sorry I think I have you know what I'm talking about though like I'm sorry if I have it all messed up but like this the age the age is wrong now because think because uh, Idy got resurrected and we learned that the soul in which Hotney Visnu resurrects someone else in is a different like is a different um it's a different soul it's not the same person so. One of the themes about um, in Corbera had to do a little bit with like, what is the soul? Is the soul just a battery to kind of power and animate the body? So it's like, let's say I, Naya Hemings, passed, passed away. And a few years ago, maybe somebody I knew named TJ passed away. So I pass away. Someone who's a hot new Vishnu on me. The body is reanimated and it has all of the memories and experiences that I did. But the soul of Naya is not actually in this body. It's TJ. You see what I'm saying? And... While I can't tell you, like, I definitively knew this analyzing, I just had an intuitive feeling that something was off. I just don't want, don't resurrect me. I don't want nobody else running around in my body, nigga. Only it could be, it could only be me. So that was honestly such a big moment, a big reveal. And you start to understand why the relationship with Tio and Idy got tested. You should call me Miss Tio. Who is this? You know what I'm saying? Like, all that stuff changed. And then her confronting her there and her having, like, the, the thing of Gon Havra's daughter in her and everything was so crazy. Like this is when I talk about that convergence moment. Then Maruna and Lee's you're about to meet up. She went straight for the neck. Like I'm gonna body this man, and it was just like absolutely crazy and fantastic. So I have to talk about that now. Let's talk about Kaz for a minute because Kaz's introduction here was really crazy. Knowing that he had the triple nil or the triple chaos uh, attribute. I'm sorry if I misremembered how the story itself framed it with the proper jargon. I believe it was triple nil or triple triple chaos, something something to that effect. But man, when you really piece together, because like one of the randomest things Asha did was resurrect you, and you're like, what connection do they have, and why? What's the reason? And when you really really figure out, like, wait a minute, Kaz would have been. Because I'm having, I guess having a triple chaos attribute is still pretty rare. So it's like Kaz has that. If Tio dies, they're going to have to seek someone else to be the priestess of chaos or priest of chaos. So Kaz would have been notified to some degree or groomed or whatever, brought up to be this new priest. And Lee's would have known that Kaz was alive and didn't pass away already, which is big wild to me. That's crazy six dimensional chest forget 4d this is six dimensions so that was magnificent I, I i oh my lord i couldn't even believe that happened but the thing i actually want to speak about related to kaz was the big brain move that he did on um maruna that was amazing with the eye of perishment and the thing that maruna wanted to kind of ascend to the next level and you know 
He's under. He's obviously underestimating Kaz. Kaz is a human. This is Maruna as we currently know him, not the one who went through the major character arc that he did that we will touch upon later. But the way that he's like, I want the universe to be destroyed and kind of tricked him and boom, I don't have it no more. And it's like, oh, Maruna was pissed and mad. Like that wasn't a, that to me wasn't a, a crazy event because I would argue that you would probably look at Kaz and think that he's a bit of a ditz or an airhead. He doesn't have the ability to kind of outsmart anybody like that. Seeing Chandra and Agni, the gods, I'm speaking to, to together too is really good. You know, Chandra is very pragmatic and an intelligent, and an intelligent, wow, an intellectual. And I like that um, one thing about people kind of like who base their life and logic and reason. I'm a bit like this. I kind of dismiss the power of emotion and the necessity of emotion and how, you know, what it means. And people like us need somebody who's a bit of an empath, a bit of an intuitive feeler to kind of ground us a little bit because all of it matters. There's times where being a bit emotional or appealing to emotion is logical. So when... Agni says you're smart, so you basically end up being correct most of the time, which is why you don't ever see the possibility of you being wrong. I like these type of little moments here. So I know this is this is probably a very a seemingly very unimportant moment, but I appreciate stuff like this because it kind of shows you the different the dichotomy and the different relationship and the different ways of approach that these two have. Agni kind of fiery, more emotional, and I would say that he's more of a thinker. Not that he's not a thinker, and the gods are usually pretty smart. So I just wanted to say that. Now Let's talk about the birth, the reveal of Neo Brilith, the GOAT version of Brilith. This I did not see coming and how this ties into the stories of ancient humans and stuff. We'll get to that, but boy, don't play with me. This was fantastic. This was probably, I'm not going to lie to you. This moment and this reveal and how it ties into the history of humanity is probably my favorite part of Kubera. Like, if you said, hey, which one of the, like, factions or races or whatever are your favorite? I will go, I'm honestly going to go with ancient humans. I mess with ancient humanity. I wish human. I wish humanity was kind of like this. It's kind of funny because recently I was having a conversation with one of my friends and he is very connected to his African roots. Oh. I, I wanna, I do, I wanna, I wanna say, Cameroonian, but I could be wrong. But anyways, I remember him saying that um, sometimes, you know, they, they have a belief that people have, you know, memories of their past lives, and sometimes if somebody is feeling, I guess you could say, maybe they're born as a man and fell as a woman, it's because in their past life they were a woman, and there's like a ritual that they have, the same way that you have the rituals for the for the ancient humans, to like be able to cope and let go of their past memories and live presently in this moment. I just found that to be a little interesting because I'm like, I wonder if this was based off something. I don't know if it has to be based off something that from that literal heritage, but I'm sure there's other cultures, ways of thinking and religious thoughts and things of that nature who believe in things like this so i just thought it was very 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 cool concept i really liked it and to, i already thought Billith was an amazing character as well as she was cares about ateria does her very best in love with agony i think it was cute you know not wanting you know learning about learning about inside and all that stuff like the journey was great but like kurgan's like like this is a 10 out of 10 character but like i could make her a 13 out of 10 with this new, with the Neo Brilith, and I think Neo Brilith is far better than the Brilith that we had before. This is my favorite version of her. I think she's great to the point where, like, on any given day, if you ask me, I might tell you my favorite character is Asha. I might tell you my favorite character is basically this version of Brilith, but as of right now, it's definitely Brilith. I think just because Asha hasn't been in the forefront too, 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 too often, maybe I'm just kind of like forgetting that she exists the same way I'm maybe not as much into the Utah and Jatawa Jatayu as I have been, but still. Uh, and she looked good. Listen, I think, listen, Asha. Asha is dope. Asha is big brain as hell, but Asha look kind of manly to me. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. Like Asha don't really look like a girl to me most most of the time or a lot of the times. I just like Asha a lot. But uh, and Bill has two hands. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but let's keep, let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Keep it moving. But yeah, like the Neo Bill stuff was absolutely fantastic. Ooh, and then we have the part where uh, Bill kind of bars up Chandra. I found it revolting. It's like iconic to me. 
whether you plan on using its strength for the information it has, it's more, it's far more valuable to you. Can't hide it. Your reaction, can you? You guys are always used to seeing other people with that convenient skill talking about inside, and now you're under receiving ends. To think humans and their ignorance have unconditional faith in someone like you, how piteous! Like the bars, my nigga, the bars. Like she came with that fiery energy. Well, not necessarily fire, cause she's pretty, she was pretty calm and cool and collected. But that was just amazing. Like I love that. I needed that from her. So it was just really, really, really good. Really nice. Um, Lee's and Kaz meeting up was very interesting. Again. Um, but. I can't. I can't explain this. And maybe so much time had passed. And. Maybe because it's been seven years. And they both thought they were gone for so long. That moment. Honestly. I would say. From an expectation standpoint. I'm not saying it was poorly executed. But probably because of the build up. And ex expectations that I had. I actually found that meet up to be slightly. Underwhelming. In the sense that I was like. I really thought that if they met. It would have been such a much bigger deal. They would have been so much more happy to see each other. And I don't know. Would have maybe gone on some type of date or something like that. I know she likes uh, um, to tie you and stuff. But still like it just. It kind of just happened. But I also appreciate that. Because it kind of reminds me of this one. So spoiler I guess for Monogatari. Or Nisei Monogatari. Um, but I've always appreciated that first final not first final confrontation doesn't make any sense but uh the confrontation with kaiki in the end because kaiki basically just kind of leaves town he did what he did on some con artist shit blah 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 and you know usually you crescendo to this big climax the antagonist the protagonist and he's like you need to leave town and he's like all right well i'm good like i'll just leave and it's like what did you think we we're gonna have some like mega ultimate shonen you know <laughs> protagonist versus antagonist climactic battle he's like no i'll leave and he just left and it's like that's real it's not exciting sometimes from a storytelling standpoint but i can always appreciate that level of realism so it actually didn't bother me in hindsight but i do remember and this is like ah thought this meeting with kaz and lees would have been such such a bigger such a bigger deal let me just tie back into the, the ID and Claude thing for a little bit, but um, still my older brother and then talk and trying to like tell the stuff to Tio, I thought was really good and kind of getting that um, the backstory when they were by the Lake of Reflection, I think it's called, the, like the little blood lake where initially um, Tio had seen God Havra's like seraphorm, which was amazing. I like this moment a lot and this, con and this conversation that they have here, I think is really good. So I just wanted to point that out. The re-meeting up of Lee's and Maruna was a little interesting too, just because like I love the part where it's like it's like the more you use the power of the sword, the deeper your sin becomes. And she just looking at him, man, like get your hands off me before I'll rip you into like what she said, like forty thousand pieces, and just like the accumulation of misfortune and stuff. And that all has significance when you, later on we learn about. You see, in Kubera there are names, and they're like names. And then there are names. You feel me? You know what I'm talking about, right? So we'll get to that in a second. I really like this part where Agni tells at Gun Harbor that dying for him is the ultimate sin. You can't die. You've done too much. You've done way too much harm. You are going to atone and repay the universe. This timeline, the best possible future for all the bullshit you've done. I can't stand this Gun Harbor nigga. I don't even want to talk about him. I'm just going to get mad. But anyways... Oh, he's gonna upset me. There was this one point, this one moment. I don't remember the two characters' name, but I remember the, the one of them was being um very, 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 very rude, and then someone came in and um basically dunked on her. Like I thought, fish were always been stupid. You may be the magic girl president, but you can't. Like why? If you're gonna be rude to other people, we should be rude to you. It's okay. Is it okay for us to not be rude to you being rude? And I'm like, damn. And then. I remember there was this part two that made me a little bit sad because it said that like Utah and Lee's couldn't have you know couldn't make love like normal lovers because they tried but like you know him he'll he'll try to devour her and it just it's just very sad <sighs> and then there was that one panel I saw with the picture of Lorraine Rartia Pure Blood. Brown hunt, brown hunt, brown hunt. E love magic guild. Recently visited the Aero Plateau. I can't stand Lorraine, guys. I'm not a fan of her. Saha deserved better. They did my guy dirty. He didn't deserve that, man. I'm so sorry, bro. I'm so sorry, man. You really didn't deserve that. And I don't know if, I don't know if you guys remember the um 
the one part where you see that kid, huh? She, what she said wasn't particularly sad, and, he, and she, and the tear dropped a little bit. You know what that means. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna comment. You know what that means. But that was a, that was amazing. Um, but yes, and then we also learned about reaching in line. Once you reach enlightenment, you actually leave behind all desire, and you don't want anything anymore. And even your will to protect the universe disappears. So a lot of them don't choose to go to that full enlightenment. You know what I'm saying? There's a bit of there's a bit of stuff with Chess and his and his story that was interesting. For some reason, I can't completely remember it, so I'm I'm sorry, but I remember that being extremely interesting and extremely important. And then uh, Fist Stage Maruna with uh, running into uh, Sampanti again, that was really good. Seeing Taraka, like what are you fighting against? Like there's so many moments, but I I, I don't forget the moment where I'm like, is that Asha? Her arm was looking kind of monstrous. The hair was long. The cloak was coming, and I'm like, this is what I've been waiting for, cause like. Because of the hot new Visnu, people were not really remembering that Asha, Asha or even Sagara on certain people really existed because of what happens with that stuff, right? But man, I know when she's fully reintegrated into the narrative, things are going to pop off because she is playing 6D chess with everybody. So that, I cannot wait for. It's going to be good, man. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. The Stabby Stabby from Brillith. You guys remember the Stabby Stabby from Brillith? You're telling me this wasn't a big move? This was a big move right here. You guys already know that was lit. So, yes. Now... We go to Kubera Lee's Anata. You have Anata's name? You what? When I saw that, I didn't even know what to think initially. I just, my brain just went. Just fried, overheat. What do I do with this? Why did she have that name? Why did you give it to her? What does it mean? Anata was the strongest. And I think learning about his sin of indifference does she take that on too you know what i'm saying like there's so much to consider there and i was just like seeing that and i'm trying to kind of make sense of the numbers and said i think it said like like n zero 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 two three ten something something ten i'm like bro what's that mean i like how much time she has left like on some death note i have the shinigami eyes i can see the date the day that which you're gonna perish you're gonna perish that was awesome and then you know <sighs> Curry God, what are you doing, man? What are you doing to us? Not this is a recap, more than supposed to be an, an analysis, but there's this is like Soul to me had a lot of really good moments that I, I, I remember to kind of write down because I thought it was good. But to, like, see, Kubera, the god of earth, I don't really trust him. I don't know what his game is. I don't know. He just, I don't like that guy. Every time he comes, I'm confused. And then they had their little conversation that was interesting. And her talking about, you listen, if the attacker tried to attack me, but I survived because of my own efforts, that doesn't exonerate the attacker. I like these little conversations here where kind of you dive into the morality of the, the, the different characters. And one thing that Curry Gum does very well that I think I've highlighted in the video at some point, but I'll say it again here because I think it's very important, is showing the different ways of thinking of the various races, the gods, to the primeval gods, if you will, to the suras, to some of the lower suras, to the humans, to the ancient humans, and how differently they all approach life. And a big part of that has to do with the level of lifespan everyone lives in. One thing I think a lot of narratives don't do well when they have these characters who are like thousands and thousands of years old and these immortal, these beings that have been alive since the beginning of time is I they're too they're just they're like in very emotional and very like I don't know I think at some point if you're alive long enough certain things just stop meaning stuff to you it's like I've been alive for millions of years I've seen humans come and go so I don't know why Cyril's like I don't care if you blow up an entire planet of the humans it's like seeing the difference sorry for all that sorry for the car going that fast seeing the difference of ideals ways of life how the tribe itself works the hierarchy in which and in, in all of them has all been all very fantastic even to the point where we see how halves and quarters tie into things who have sura blood in them so curry gum does a very good job highlighting all the differences between all of those moving parts there so you got to give her credit for that that was really good i need to talk about lila dream her dream tracking with claude Claude is a character that I actually enjoy a lot. You guys right now, I'm a, I'm a bit of a priest, priest and priestess merchant, but Lila, to me, really, really did a lot of stuff in this season that maybe like her even more. I already like Lila. I thought that the, the goofy little earmuffs and face thing was really cool. Plus, she's a Kubera. You guys know that already. But listen, when, they were, when she was dream tracking Claude and decided to save him and everything, 
at the cost of his memories because I like the God who caused my teacher to die or because I feed him or because I think he's in the right and the way that they were talking and he, to, that, to, the, to the shadowy figure saying, you know, how Claude aspires to cold rationality but has not lost his habit of falling headlong into anything that interests him, which resembles his old friend, that little back and forth and her trying to uncover some secrets and whatnot. That's a really good moment to me. Like, I, it stands out to me in the entirety of Kubera and Lila is a character that I hope gets to continue to have a lot of shine and being extremely important and her relationship with Chandra is always something that I've liked and appreciated and then Agni talking about um, some of the things that he's had to do in his over the course of his long long life where sometimes the decisions that he makes doesn't reflect what he really needs or wants or wants he does what's needed and this also ties into Brilith too because despite Brilith's contempt and anger towards some of the people who have killed her and harmed her in her past lives because remember she's an ancient human soul which we have not talked about yet we'll get into in a second she was willing to put aside all of that stuff for the sake of the best possible future, which I think is pretty selfless. I can't do that. I couldn't do that. You, everyone, everyone's gone. I'm fighting everybody. <laughs> like, I'm not playing with y'all, so shout out to them. Because I often ask this question, how bad or how much of a downgrade is the quote-unquote second, second best outcome or second best possible future second best possible universe whichever terminology you want to use how bad is it do we really need to be going through all this pain and suffering do we really need to save that fish gone hover like do we need to is it an absolute necessity so <laughs> i'll be thinking about it all the time i'm like i honestly would would argue that maybe you just tone it like just you know what it is what it is let's just go for the second best one but they seem to be super adamant on not doing that so yeah now let's dive into some of the some of the things that i really want to talk about i want to talk about ancient humanity and why i like them so much i kind of spoke about a little bit of like the i like the concept of you know i really like the concept of the of humanity growing from a technological standpoint in this fashion because i think it's brilliant let's say i was one of the first humans ever born, ever um created and i'm from like the caveman era i make fire man make fire and it's like okay i made fire in this life and i was a hunter gatherer or something and i'm born in the next life and it's like i continue to be able to kind of hone and craft and continue to do what i do well because if i'm gonna like i might not have to live the exact same life and i might have the same body it might be the same gender but i would argue that this is the like humanity would progress really quickly if you could kind of hold on to your past memories if i had a past mem memories of being a scientist and i'm still interested in science i can just kind of combine the two life lifetime together i mean the coming age ceremony kind of changes certain things but i was just like man seeing some of the technology and towers and things they had to fend off server attacks and everything to me they look a, they look a hell of a lot more advanced than what this current universe's um humans look like uh, have, have accomplished and it seems like the humans have advanced at a much quicker rate back in the day they're so fascinating to me i want to talk about the weight of time now because this the weight of time and the other side of the story to me are two of the best six arcs in Kubera. I actually think Enemy has a very strong start. I love Soul. I think Frozen Tears is good. Crime and Punishment is really is really dope. There's a lot of good ones. I think um, Asha, the small one for Asha, that's fantastic. There's a lot of good ones. I mean, and, and The Night That Rained Fire, I would say, is one of the first early arcs. We're like, ooh, ooh, ooh like we're getting to something really good here. But, yes, The Weight of Time. And seeing maruna go through the character arc that he did was truly a treat because he's come so far and he's lived so long and had to see and see so much to start to kind of change his way of thinking because he has a pretty general way of thinking that is in line with most suras and kind of knows his place and try to outstep and tries to keep certain types of relationships with the varying other clans depending on his relations to them what he may or may not need to them or his emotional feelings towards them i recall when ran and maruna are kind of walking through the place beyond time and it's like ran is mad talkative ran is very blah 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 yada yada maruna's like bro shut up shut up my nigga shut up like you're talking too much 
And then you see it later on when he's like with Raul Tara and Raul Tara has been kind of had the will to live being out of her. And he's the one in that ran role. He's flying around. He's trying to talk. He's trying to engage. It's like that changed him was real. And him seeing ancient humanities actually saving them from time to time from attacks and things like that was something I never expected to see while he's just waiting for ran or just waiting for whatever he can do. And it's like, bro. How did we get here? This is incredible. Like, I don't... I love timey-wimey stuff. I'm a fan of time travel. I'm a fan of the many-world interpretation theory. I love multiple timelines, branching timelines. I like multiple universes, pocket dimensions, all that stuff. That probably comes from my background of loving Marvel and DC Comics and things, and things like that. But I actually find a lot of times with anime, with manga, with webtoons sometimes, when we get into these type of concepts... People tend to kind of lose interest or not be into it, especially for some reason, time travel is something that's very contentious with a lot of people. Though I do understand that time travel is one of those things, if you don't kind of do it properly within your narrative, you will kind of ruin it. It's not a joke. Like, if you don't handle time, 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 I say timing, why me? Because of like, um, uh, I said, I almost said Doctor Strange. What the hell is that show called? The Doctor, I don't know. Anyways, I don't watch it, but <laughs> yeah, I I do like time stuff. I think it can really enhance your narrative if you if you do it do it properly. But yes, seeing this journey in which he goes on meeting uh, Surya, the God of Light, and everything it was honestly a really 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 good treat, and I loved it. You got to see Asha in that world a little bit for you know a little bit. That was really good. She kind of made a comment about Ran. That was really good. Like, oh man, Ranch is there like, oh God, what's going on? And then we learn about the resentment of being killed and how that can kind of translate to in, into another human's life when they're kind of being resurrected and stuff. But it is funny just seeing them throw like confetti on Maruna and he's like, what is going on here? And stuff like that. And then him running into Raltara, that was really, 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 really good. And then him meeting somebody he met in a previous life and just like the slow but sure journey because you see him he's in his outfit he's in his outfit and then he's in more and more and more human clothing too like even just from a visual standpoint and then him actually confronting god kubera brahma coming and being like oh this she's just mad that an experiment didn't go the way that she wanted and they're all gonna die soon anyways and just like damn Trying to Yama later on, and then learning about the God Realm, and now we have, um, you have Agni. He's reading. Don't call me God Agni. Don't call me that. And it's just wow. And I would, and I think the way it ends too is really good, because then you kind of see a little bit of the back of Yaksha, the first of the Yaksha clan, and how that ties into another story, which is now Rand's half. Because when Rand came back at some point, he seemed a lot different. You know, we saw a thing in his fifth stage, uh, Marona's fifth stage, and Rand was like on some next level demonic stuff. And it's like, no, the character journey that he went to, he went through, is equally as interesting as Maruna's. But I'd argue it's the opposite. And I don't know if anyone else kind of believes that. I would say that Maruna's Maruna went on an uptick, like a trend to being a better more well-rounded i'm not gonna say human being but person being like maruna's not the same dickhead at the beginning of the story who just did not give a f about any human for any reason at all he's come such a long way we even learned a little bit of that he's been in love a couple of times and his crush on simpanti a little bit that's some of that stuff came in um the, the special chapters and everything and i kind of think maybe raltar i don't know we'll see then we have ran where i'll say it's hard to say fully because we haven't fully kind of dived into it but Rand seems to have gone the opposite direction he seems a little crueler a little colder a little less Rand you know Rand and Lutz uh funnily have a very similar personality but you know Lutz can kind of turn it off to Lutz or Lutz whatever could turn it off and do what he needs to do as and and fulfill his role because he's I would also argue he's one of those characters that kind of lean into that sign of logic and reason more so than emotion and intuitiveness but Ran as with training with Yaksha, getting Yaksha's heart, meeting his grandma, grandpa, Hanuman, all of that stuff. 
the fact that he got his head blown off and had that memory, because we always knew during the upheaval or the cataclysm, I'm not sure what translation you guys usually go by, we always knew something was off. Something was weird. Something was different. And we never knew what what, what was the truth behind that story with uh, Rana and um, whatnot. And we learned that the truth. Like, I always knew or felt that um, Ran was actually the one that kind of murdered his parents during because he couldn't control himself and what stuff. Because obviously, when one of the one of the suras that lead your clan kind of go uh, berserk, or whatever, the emotional resonance causes some of the other clan member to kind of feel that same emotion. They can't always control themselves. But getting that proper reveal was a big deal. I really like that. I think Yaksha, the first the first of his clan, is an incredibly good character. I love him. The, what he did for Ran, I think, was so, so special. And then him getting to get his heart back right at the end to flex against Asura just a little bit because Asura's got to come for him, blah, blah. And then he took him and he yeeted him. Yeet! Into the goddamn planet. I said, bro, why are you tossing like that? I loved it. I loved it. It was great. It was great. Seeing a Nana just yoinks. Um, Ral Tara from Sagara too. Like, listen, just give me, just give me her, man. Just give it to me. Like, what are you doing over there? Like, let's cut that out. Let's cut that out. Like, we don't need all of that. I don't think I spoke about the Cali, Cali confronting Lee's too much. I know, but I, I spoke with the name a little bit. But that was a good moment. I don't want to, I don't want to over, overlook that. I don't want to go too into into it because I think I want us to cover that separately. But the weight of time and the other side of the story to me are like the two sides of the same coin or whatever you want to call it. But I just I found it very very great. I actually thought this arc had a lot of really nice big surification battles where Ran fought with Hanuman. That was really dope. And then. Obviously, Yak shot a couple of fights. That was really dope, looking really looking like a boss, looking very menacing. And you just gotta, you just gotta put respect on it. And then like the scale and scope of which, how big they get, how they dwarf these planets, how these beams can just travel like light to across, across space and stuff. You gotta love it. I thought the stuff with Kanara too was really good. The Kanara clan and meeting Kanara and knowing stuff about Aryavata and seeing how like her position is weird, being the leader but not necessarily being the strongest. A lot of that, a lot of those things came into play. So you gotta talk, you gotta, you gotta mention that too. And I think this has made Rand very, very strong. I don't think anybody in present time understands how much more powerful Rand has gotten. He's going to be a problem for a lot of people, especially those who are gonna decide to under underestimate him. There was always something a bit different about him, but with this now, it's over. So really, really, really good stuff. I think the enemy started really, really solid. Gone Harvard ruins everything can't stand him but i'm not gonna talk too much about that part right now i'm gonna leave that there but just like but, but just let it be known of this of this video i am on the fourth chapter of enemy but i do think it started off with a bang extremely powerful but let's talk about some characters that i think need to be mentioned a little bit i want to talk about jatayu yuta because yuta hasn't been a major focus of this arc of this arc wow of this um season and the reason why I want to bring him up is because I often I often say that I I personally very much enjoy how Curry Gum handles this cast, the ever expensive cast of, of Kubera. I think she does a very good job. I'm not saying it's a perfect way of doing it. When you have these stories where as the characters keep uh, growing and going to new places or the same places at different times and things change and you keep getting more and more characters and the, and the cast starts to get bigger and bigger i truly think it is very difficult to be able to handle all of that it's not easy it's freaking hard and different authors have different ways of doing it some authors try to just give everybody minimal focus everybody a lot of focus or they don't know what they're doing they have to start cutting characters like okay like yeah, in terms of importance i gotta make you you have to get less time so this character get more time blah 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 curry gum shifts her focus depending on what's happening i could i could make the argument that for a lot of people this is a bad thing let's say you don't like ran and you don't really like maruna and you love you love Lee's. The fact that you haven't seen Lee's in probably a couple of years now, like to that to that effect, and these stories have been focusing on two characters you don't particularly have that much investment in, I can see how that can be a bothersome or troublesome and how that can make you lose some investment in the story. 
I, however, think that because Curry Gum doesn't really have any characters that I would say, this is a poorly written character. It's a characters I don't like. I can't stand Lorraine. Can't stand Gun Havra. I don't think they're poor characters. And by that, that doesn't necessarily mean, hey, this character is written so well. God tier. It's as simple f for me as um, this character serves a very deliberate purpose and executes that well. So that's how I will describe Lorraine. Though I do think that Gon Havre is actually like a, a really good character. I just, I just don't like him. So back on, back on track on a bit of a tangent. I'm sorry. So I appreciate how she handles the cast by f taking focus off Lee's and then off Jatayu. Then we're on Maruna. And then maybe we're talking about Asha. Then we're on Brilith and Agni. Like I like that. Because the way that she always ties in the reintroduction or refocus of a character. It always usually connects to what's happening currently or what the previous characters have already done so what i mean by that okay we're focusing on maruna right and then maruna and ran were together for a while so with the other side we're like oh this is what ran was doing while maruna was doing this waiting for him or trying to find him and stuff like that like sure we hadn't had that focus on ran maybe for a little bit i think i know ran wasn't out the picture for that long all things considered i'm just saying i'm just i'm just saying like boom reintroduce what he's doing oh wait that directly ties into what's happening so you have to give credit where credit is due you have to you have to because honestly i hear a lot of people talk about the writing in this series and writing in that series and it's like i just don't it don't move me y'all y'all be capping a lot of times but the way that you describe like the way i think to you, you think togashi writes or something like that i'm like this is how curry gum actually writes like this is the respect that she should be getting. Which is, and it still baffles me that this series is not as popular as it should be. But anyways, nothing we can do about that. It's just, it's, just, it's sad. I do got to say this. This is just a, pers a personal thing. I don't know if I'm... I want Claude... Claude has retained his personality. But without the blessing that he received, he's coming across a lot differently to me. What he, what he said with uh, to Lee's the conversation that they had and stuff was still very, very, very good. But I'm hoping that we can re reclaim some of the old one. Now, see, at, at Sierra, the other one with the brown hair and stuff, the long, long hair, he had a very interesting character arc. I want to talk about him because I would argue that out of all the priests, to some degree, he was the one that was by far the least interesting or the least memorable until the situation that Chandra and them um, made up made with the little crystals and stuff and he went into what he went into and he came out like a different nigga like what the fuck like he's with Asha talking and that stuff was crazy I love it because he kind of like they like, kind of being pooped on even in special chapters they're like pooping on him like oh he's out of vigor already haha blah, blah blah and it's like look what look what he's become now he's a demon he's a demon now look what you guys have done so Anywho, that's all really, really, real, real good and dandy. I want to say this one thing about enemy. Then I want to talk about some of just miscellaneous things that I think are interesting. And I'm going to wrap it up. I'm not going to ramble too long because I think you guys are probably sitting here like, all right, guy, I'm tired of hearing your voice. The really cool thing about enemy that I'm currently digging is I don't know why I never thought about this initially, but if we're going to be you know, talking about a story and narrative that has a lot of romantic stuff and it's a romance a fantasy romance at the end of the day but one of the big goals is to get the best possible timeline outcome possibility future universe right how could we not explore the ones that get deleted that are the bad versions that are not ideal or third best how could we not explore those timelines those different universes and the fact that we are doing that right now, I think is extremely significant. It's super important. And I think this will let us know why maybe a lot of the gods are like, yo, it's this best possible future or bust type beat. Do you feel what I'm saying? So I just think that that is something that we have to keep an eye on. I don't want to talk too much about what's happening there because, you know, but yeah, that's just very, 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 very good stuff. Very good stuff. Now, for a couple of characters, I just want to talk about a little bit just to highlight them because I think it's kind of important. I think I was supposed to be talking about Jutayu. Did I? Did I? I may have run, I may have run the tangent because I didn't want to talk about him. The reason why I was talking about Yuta Jutayu was because Yuta to me was very a very focal point, a very big focal point in the second season. Him, his weird, his weird little affection with Lee's. 
the fact that <laughs> um, he was transforming to his next stage, learning about Maruna, blah, 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 the connection to Kelly, and all of that. He, I, I would say he had a much more proactive role, and as he's been more of this astral projection, more in the background, stuck in the Sorum Realm version of himself, I can't lie to you guys. It's not that I don't think he's interesting. I, I just have, I just, I've, he's on the, he's on the back burner for me. So I constantly, like, oh yeah, 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 you tell, yeah, yeah, what's up? You know, like, you know, like it, it happens like that a lot of the time. So I just wanted to highlight that because I think, I think it is very easy to sometimes, somewhat. Not forget the character exists, but not think about them too much when they're not in the forefront. Unless it's a character you obviously just have a lot of emotional and physical investment. Physical? Yeah, I mean, yeah, physical investment in anything. They hot, yeah, you know. This this show got a lot of hot boys with their shirts off. Agni? You think you me, huh? Got your chest out. But anyways, this this season has been an absolute treat. It is not done. We're going to keep going. We're going to see how it turns out. We're going to see how it... uh. How it all finishes. I want to bring you guys some discussions. I want to do a video for you guys on my second read through, speaking about all the things I didn't notice on my first read through because Kubera is obviously a series that's extremely dense with information and dense with things in terms of what you have to remember, even from just the first season. Therefore, this is one of the series that I say. If you're a huge fan of it, there's no way you read it less than twice, minimum twice, and you have to revisit arcs in your favorite moments a lot of the time. Because with the foreknowledge that you have of the whole scope of the series and the latest events that happens, when you go back and you read the beginning, you notice so much more because you have the knowledge already. So it's going to enhance the story for you with a with multiple multiple read-throughs, honestly. So fantastic. Think this season's been a friggin' 10. 10 does not mean perfect to me. It means masterpiece. There is not a single person, story, game, book, concept, whatever that I think is perfect. Nothing in this world is friggin' flawless. I don't care what you think. It's, that's just not, that's not true. No person, no story, no game, no plant, whatever. I said plant. What the hell? I, I looked at my cactus. That's why I said that. <laughs> but... Intent is a masterpiece because I think about what you are, what your intentions are with the story, what your intentions are with the character, what your intentions are with the arc, and if you do that to a high level, I give you, I give you credit. What do I mean by that? If your series is a comedy series and I'm laughing, you're getting a ten. I don't care. I don't have to be like, oh, it needs more action, not enough romance. No, am I laughing? What's the what's the intended purpose of the narrative as a comedy? I want to make you laugh. I am laughing every other page. You're doing a job. 10 out of 10. Anyways, thank you guys for listening. Like, subscribe, share, comment your thoughts. I very much love being a part of this community. This is like the only community right now in terms of like, I like, I like, JoJo. I like JoJo fans. Other than the JoJo, I guess. We're like, I honestly, I feel welcome. I feel loved. I feel valued. I like that. I like the community. No one's been like nasty or mean yet or annoying. I haven't met. And I've, I was speaking with a lot of Kumara fr fans who are, who are French speakers too, which I'm like, you guys don't know I'm bilingual. So if you watched through this video, and you're someone who speaks both languages or, you know, French or predominantly French. And you want to hit me up on Twitter at Young Paperwork or whatever. You can always speak to me in French. Je suis bilingue. It's not a problem. All right, guys. I wish you a mighty fine day. Hit notifications. Breath. I know that box is fire.